What is up, my friends? This is the Protect Your Neck Podcast, and I'm your host, Dan Tom. Analyst is work you can find over at MMA Junkie as well as linemovement.com. But on this here program, the Protect Your Neck Podcast, we break down high level MMA, and that's what we're going to do here today, but in a different way. That's right, as I'm sure you probably heard on the intro. Uh, Dan Tom over here is on vacation, but we recorded this uh, kind of in the uh, pre time uh, of this pandemic time to get you some entertainment to reflect, even though the UFC schedule or the MMA schedule really is not giving us a break to appreciate history. That doesn't mean we can't. However, I'm not going to torture you like a usual podcast with just my voice. I need a co-host for these shows. So I'm bringing along one that I've always wanted to uh, have on because I love his podcast, which is the Heavy Hands Podcast. I'm sure you're all listening to that. It is Phil McKenzie at Evil Greg Jackson on Twitter. What is up, Phil? Hey, Dan. Uh, yeah, lovely to be here. Um, yeah, fantastic to like take a bit of a... A different look at, at, at MMA history uh, with one of these like top five shows. Yeah, I mean, top five is the most played out thing. I definitely don't claim to uh, originate it. In fact, I always give credit to uh, the podcast uh, I, I rip because I'm a fan of them and I want to give them their deserved shot. The Film Vault, of course, they do it with film, you know, like top five bad cops and stuff like that. Um, and, and whatnot, uh, Phil, I know you not just, you know, you appreciate, you know, movies as well as, uh, games and pop culture and whatnot. So I said, why not adapt this to like our own little weird world of MMA? And, uh, that's what I'm attempting to do here. So I appreciate you humoring the journey and jumping on, man. Yeah, it sounds great. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's one of the great things about MMA is there's so many like different lenses you can look at it through. Uh, I think a lot of people get fixated on um, the idea of, you know, who's the best, number one, number two, number three, and so on. You know, we've seen that kind of talk popping up again with, um, uh, you know, Anson Silva's recent retirement. But, you know, it, it's nice to take uh, like a just a, a, a weirder look at, you know, what, what the top fives could be. Like, I'd, uh, like you, you were saying before we started recording, you had – Connor on to do the the top five uh, hook knockouts in the in the UFC and yeah I, I really like it as a as a um, concept. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like this is your top five. It's not the top five, right? And there is a distinction which not everybody makes. And even though I'm gonna venture wild guess, Phil, you're kind of like me, and you could really care less about dying on any hills for pound for pound or all time great talk. But Very true, <laughs> right? But one of the things that did, that does upset me, kind of circling back to this theme, is that regardless of what anyone's argument or what the topic is being discussed, it just upsets me that history, amongst many things, um, aren't taken into account. It's just very rigid for what is a really super broad and subjective thing to even uh, attempt to talk about in the first place. So no hard rules here, folks. But uh, yes, uh, we're going to go and do top five unluckiest fighters. I don't even think I announced the topic, did I? Um, this is This is an interesting one. To kind of set it up off the top. Um, so when we talked about, you know, top five unluckiest fighters, like I posted on Twitter, we talked about, you know, bad beats, uh, potential, you know, careers uh, cut short, so to speak. Um, or, you know, just, uh, you know, a, a multitude of other things. Again, I don't I don't want to, you know, uh, we can, we're allowed to color outside the lines here on this show. Um, but basically, that's kind of the things that came to my mind. Um Phil, what came to your mind when we, we were kind of parsing out, you know, uh, topics? We ended up landing on this one. We seem to both like it. Um, what kind of came to your mind uh, as far as, you know, the theme for this one? I mean, I guess uh, like in, in a lot of those, uh, in a lot of ways in MMA, it's just the fact that like luck can be so many things. And, you know, it's something which also... It, it, I think it, it colors fights as well. I mean, there, there's definitely it, it's very contentious to ever say that like uh, a win that someone got is like a lucky one. Uh, there's been lots of like heated debates over this to say that you know someone someone just like won because of luck because there's always you know MMA is always a mixture of luck and intention and um, you know it, and it, it's very very difficult to pass these things out. But it's also just like it's undeniably a very high variant sport. You know, it doesn't have uh, particularly strong betting lines unless there's huge uh, like favorites, and it just has a lot of like crazy things that can happen in it. Yeah. So, um, 
what I was thinking of when I, when I was thinking of like my top five, when I was trying to think of, I was trying to think of all the, not necessarily so much like the most cursed individuals in, in MMA, because in all honesty, the, there's a solid chance that those are guys that we've simply never heard of. That there was some guy who was just an incredible prospect that just got completely cut off before his MMA career even got started by something um, like terrible. Right, right. And so I think there's there's lots of ways in which these things can go go wrong. Like there's you know people whose entire MMA journey was like doomed from the start. There's people who like seem to just be cursed by slapstick devils. Uh, <laughs> There's, you know, people who just when they were on the brink of greatness, uh, you know, things happened, conspired against them. I think there's, uh, yeah, so there, there was a lot of like different ways that things could go wrong. And, and with my, uh, like my picks, the way I went for it, I, I tried to go for a bit of a spread. Yeah, same here. Um, I, I, I stayed more, a lot of times, you know, I, I'll definitely always have my hipster picks, which we'll get to, which I often place at number five. But mm-hmm. um, I, I tend to stay a little I don't want to say rigid, but more um, toward the topic. Uh, for one, a lot of times that, you know, with MMA Junkie, we'll truncate these into a video version. And even though I do want to stick to keeping it to my list, uh, you're well aware of the uh, land of internet comments, especially in the MMA sphere, mm-hmm. when you don't get things right, Phil. Um, so I do have to kind of, you know, have a bit uh, more conservatism than my contrarian uh, self would like at times. But it also allows my guests freedom to really just, you know, paint away with whatever they like because, and that was part of the reason why I, I pitched and put the pressure on my guests to come up with a topic because it may seem daunting at first, but oftentimes you get the better product um, when it's something that someone is, um, maybe passion, it's too strong of a word, right? But you get what I'm saying there. And a reason as we close off this setup here, uh, why I'm glad I selected you for this one in particular, because you look at it, this could be a really depressing uh, episode, you know what I'm saying? Like it runs that risk where I'm getting gimmick infringement letters from Zane Simon at the end, going, "Hey, buddy, you get it. You best get off the uh, the, the the depressing territory." And uh, all all respect to Zane and Bloody Elbow over there. I don't I don't need I don't need any hate. Uh, <laughs> shouts to that, by the way, the MMA Depress. This another um, fantastic podcast that you may have uh, heard Phil McKenzie on. And uh, again, we did top five duos on this. Uh, I had I had Connor Rebus, your 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 co-host or the host, I should say, of the the Heavy Hands podcast on for top five hook KOs for my, uh, my listeners familiar with that episode um, was one of my favorites. But man, I, I just got to pay a quick comment as we push uh, a compliment as we push forward that uh, if it was like podcast duos, man, you and Connor would be in the top five. I'm a big fan of Patrick uh-huh. Wyman. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I definitely miss Pat was lis- was listening to the podcast toward the end of Pat's run. Uh, but when they switched over, I was like, who is this? This I've seen this guy on Twitter and Man, you're just you're a, a, a comical motherfucker, just to use you know really crude uh, language there, for <laughs> lack of a better terms. Um, and uh, I love how you you interplay with Connor, who I already already love, obviously. Um, and uh, I'm like, yeah, I need somebody that has a sense of humor for this type of topic for sure, man. So thank you for coming on for uh, this one. Yeah, that's that's incredibly kind. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I was a big fan of Heavy Hands before I before I ever gave if I ever came on the show. So. Uh, Pat Wyman, uh, like, obviously, like, he had big shoes to fill. I obviously don't think I filled them in, like, the same way that Pat did. Definitely a very different co-host. But, yeah, I, I hope that some people, uh, like, still enjoy listening to the show, uh, like, now that I'm here. Even though I've, I've, you know, I've been on the show for, like, for several years now, I guess. Um, but, yeah, and also, thank you for letting me know that we can swear by saying motherfucker. Uh, I wasn't sure, and now I know. <laughs> oh, this podcast, yeah, this is... Uh... I tend to uh, really color outside the lines with the uh, inappropriateness, language, and all the above. So believe me, my, I've subjected my listeners to worse. And um, and, and on that note, as uh, as I pay appreciation to a guest that I've been meeting to have on, in the words of Harvey Keitel, I believe in Pulp Fiction, uh, let's not start sucking each other's dicks quite yet, gentlemen. We still got a top five to do, so let's get down. Uh, let's get down to it, um, Phil. I, I, I guess you know, kind of like we talked uh, before. Uh, I'll, I'll take I'll take the lead just to kind of get the the flow going. But we will do a, a Chinese fire drill at some point in time and, and end up uh, inadvertently or on purposely or not, I should say, uh, switching up order. Does that sound cool with you? Mm-hmm. No worries. All right. So um, as I alluded to, my number five is a hipster pick, and I don't believe, especially as an appreciator of history, 
uh, that you need to be alive at a certain point to appreciate certain things or be with it. Although I will say it does, I think, bring a bias to everyone's list and some and a deserved bias, by the way. Right. Because it can make the most sometimes it's not a very entertaining result. Like, why would this be on a top five? But maybe you have a story, you know, like my buddy Jordan Killian. It, one of my favorites was he was at a Buffalo Wild Wings and it was a bunch of like like affliction wearing off duty cops that was like Tito Ortiz yeah uh, against Bader <laughs> and he was like and he was like the smart MMA guys like oh these guys have no clue Bader's gonna wash him and he was like dude Bader's gonna win and not only did he get like dissension but they were like calling him like uh, the not the really not nice f word let's just say this is you know yeah. this is over 10 years ago folks right and of course he's like all right all right we'll see we'll see what happens you know i think bader was like probably like a minus 700 favorite tito had, hadn't won in eight years right and of course tito hits mm-hmm. the upset and it's just like oh and so that makes it a much better um story than perhaps a deflating fight that it was if, if that makes sense right uh huh. Absolutely. Um. So uh, I don't have any of these for my number five, although that bias does exist. My number five actually happens in one of my favorite UFCs and kind of plays into opposite of um of a uh, of, of a list we did where it was top five unlikeliest heroes, which is another fun one, right? With MMA. Um. Mm-hmm. But opposite of unlikely heroes again is what we're we're covering the unlucky guy, right? And Canada may have some appearances on both our lists, folks, but uh, it starts at UFC 3 with what could have been the first Canadian champion, uh, UFC champion, first Canadian tournament champion, and that is Harold Howard at UFC 3. Are you familiar with this gentleman, Phil? Yep. That's right. He, of course, for people, I think the more recognizable thing, uh, especially in the GIF age of the internet, is the, uh, you know, they have a saying where I'm, co- uh, you know, where we, where we come from. If you're coming on, then come on, I believe is what he said. Forgive me if I just butchered it. But uh, that's the kind of thing you'll see on the internet of still. He's got the mullet, the missing tooth, um, the Bret Hart, the Hitman Hart glasses, like everything about an aged out early 90s look that you could appreciate. I know I did, uh, you know, and Harold Howard essentially comes into this tournament and he wasn't a favorite by any means. I mean, you've got Hoist and Shamrock in here, right? Uh, this is what people were waiting for since UFC one. Of course, Hoist was able to win UFC two, which was an impressive feat, uh, being that he had to win four fights in one night, granted. You know, I'm not going to draw straws of the competition he had that night. We jump over to UFC 3, and that's when he has his, like, hard fight with Chemo, right? So where he's super tired and he goes off kind of hobbled off, you know, and Chemo and, and, and Joe uh, uh, Chemo and Joe San. And yep. um, he, uh, you know, you, you suspect he's not 100%, but Harold Howard, you know, he comes off of just, like, knocking out. Uh, looks like Jason Brills' dad in the first round, uh, and and he he's ready to go. And sure enough, it's a really depressing moment. And I really wish the camera caught the towel throw moment, which I believe came from Helio. Helio's in the corner, folks. That's right. Um, and you see first the politics of uh, Horian trying to talk to Big John and trying to say it without saying it. And then you see the cornermen start going in, getting under Hoyce's arms. Hoist is looking really distraught and kind of like he's going to pass out. I'm not casping judgments, but you could see what was going on, right? You could see what was coming. And I think Helio kind of had enough of the showmanship on, on, on their end and was just like, let's just call it. He throws the towel, which was huge, right? This is before Sakuraba, you know, Pride 2000, folks, that moment. Um, and Harold Howard rightfully pissed off. He, 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 he would have been the first guy to beat the Gracie, right? So not only does he, you know, mm-hmm. get robbed of the things I say off the top if you just look at his resume, he gets robbed to face Hoist Gracie. So now, you know, you fast forward to the finals. Ken Shamrock, he had a couple long fights himself. Like, he, he had this really long first-round fight against a judo guy, I believe, Leminger. Um, and then he, he he beats the next guy. Uh, and uh, But for uh, you could tell, again, this is the Wild West, folks. It's not like, you know... Um, these contender series guys who like no offense to contender series, but you know, a guy like Harold Howard's got to be pulling, you know, uh, well, I'll actually save that reference for a a fighter even later on, but like, it's not like these contender series guys where it's like, you know, you can dangle a, a high risk, low reward carrot and be like, but come on, it's the UFC. Like the UFC is not an established product folks. This is like a freak show. You know what I'm saying? Like there's no promise of tomorrow. Um, in many standpoints, the fact that you could die and it was in the contract and it, in the environment of things, it was a real possibility in their head to the business, you know, fly by night organization that it essentially was dancing with. Um, so, you know, 
Ken Shamrock, you can read into what you will. And I, I, I still got this, you know, I still got shout out to Jonathan Snowden. I still haven't dug into his book. I'm sure the answers are right in front of me. Again, really bad podcast host here, folks. Um, I'm sure it explains why, but, you know, you could kind of see it was a real high risk, low reward. In short, Ken Shamrock doesn't come out. So now, not only is Harold Howard, you know, um, he's, he's robbed of his chance to beat Hoist. Uh, he's robbed of himself to a chance to put himself over against a big name like Ken. But it's okay. He can still maybe become the first Canadian champ, tournament champ, you know, uh, for the UFC. And in steps Steve Jenham. Thankfully, they have an alternate, right? And they play his promo role. And I don't know uh, if, if you went back to watch this or how long it's been, Phil. But, like, Steve Jenham, and I'm sure you would agree with me if you watched this, Phil. They show the bag work. And, like, this dude has the best bag work than anybody um, on UFC 3 <laughs> and arguably even going back to Art Jimison, you know, in, in the UFC short history. Like, this guy's throwing left hooks, short elbows, rolling, like, doing shoulder rolls. And he's, like, a black belt in ninjutsu, but he's actually got, like, hip tosses, arm bars, like, super competent stuff. I'm like, dude, his warm-up reel is more impressive than anybody. How is this guy, like, they already went through, like, three alternates or something that night. I'm like, how is this guy, like, fourth string alternate? Whatever, he comes in, he's a cop, right, from Nebraska. So it's like all these dudes with flat tops and mustaches, right? It's so, it's so cop. It's so early 90s. Um, and they have their own version of the Gracie train. And, of course, Harold Howard did his Canadian Gracie train, which was pretty funny. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, in steps Harold Howard. He does, the fight starts, and he essentially starts off. Harold Howard's like a big dude, by the way, Philly. He's 6'2". To the audience, by the way, uh, he's 6'2", 230 pounds. He starts off with, like, a rolling thunder, like he's Justin Gaethje or something. And then he, like, hits uh, he hits uh, Jenham with a right hand. And you see that Jenham, like, uh, takes it. And Harold Howard gets discouraged that he could take it. And Jenham realizes that he could take it. And he turns into Nick Diaz, and he's waving him on. And uh, Harold Howard goes to jab. And Jenham goes from Nick Diaz mode to, like, legit splits a jab and lands a jab of his own on a much bigger guy. Follows that momentum of the slip. Enters for a takedown, like a slick, like, kind of knee-tap sweep takedown. Passes to mount. And then pounds out Harold Howard, who, another reason why, he, you know, people thought he would have won, not just because of his size, but he was a black belt, not just karate, but uh, the Japanese jiu-jitsu. So he, he showed semblance of ground games and, like, underhooks early. But it didn't matter. Once he got on his back, he got outdone um, by uh, Jenham. And he had to tap out due to strikes. <laughs> and and uh, closing off, and I'll let you comment on this, Phil, because you'll really appreciate this part. In his post-fight speech after losing, he's really gracious, Harold Howard, right? He's got like a, a karate school up in Canada at the time. And he goes, he goes, I just want to tell my kids that I'm okay and that I love them. I want to tell my wife that I love them. And I want to tell my family, believe it or not, I love my family too. And I was like, that seemed kind of <laughs> repetitive. Yeah. And not to overly pick him apart, the guy, you know, just got his head bashed in kind of. But I go to his Wikipedia, and I'll close with my long-winded selection and let you take over the steering wheel here, Will. But uh, <laughs> it goes like this. It goes, sorry, let me shrink the screen here so I adjust it. These e-cam windows are playing. He goes, uh, okay. <laughs> um, Harold, How Harold Howard, uh, on December 22nd, uh, uh, 2009, Harold Howard was charged with two counts of attempted murder, two counts of an assault with a weapon, attempted oh, yeah. breaking and entering, failure to remain, flight from police. So this sounds like really Rambo right here, but okay, I'm going to read on. Dangerous operation of a motor vehicle, mischief, and two counts of breach of reconnaissance after being captured by police, which kind of sounds like he had to smuggle something somewhere. Ew. Um, the events leading to said arrest include attacking his sister and nephew with a hammer. I mean, the guy first off starts off his career by impersonating the Gracies with the Gracie train, and then he ends it by impersonating old boy. Okay. Attempting to force his way into an estranged wife's home. And finally, crashing his car into the Falls View River Casino. In the end, wow. Harold was sentenced to just shy of five years in prison. Phil. <laughs> okay, this, this man is not sounding so much as unlucky. As... 
but, but, he but, is just a tornado of criminality. But listen, listen. Before then, he, you know, uh, he, uh, he, he had his own karate schools. Was pretty successful up in Canada. Um, you know, after he didn't fight much, he ends up closing his MMA record, I believe, at one and three. Right. Um, he at least won one UFC fight, which is you will page to note that for a later selection. Okay. But again, I'm not defending the guy, Phil, but you know, as they say in comic books, or I dare say quote comic books or dare quote a movie like Unbreakable, you know, the bad guy is pretty sympathetic if you just look at the cards that maybe he was dealt and maybe one, I'm not saying I'm, I'm justifying, I'm not saying I'm even arguing, but let's just, let's just play devil's advocate for a second here. Let's say he's able to get like a, a Hoy's Gracie scalp, right? Or a Ken Shamrock scalp. And if he was able to hypothetically get one of the scalps, he was winning that tournament, right? Steve Gentleman. Uh, Steve Jennings not yep. seeing the light of day, so we've seen what a UFC title can can do. I mean, look what Boss Rutten was able to do off of unfairly winning a, a title off of his back as his best win. And, and yep. I'm not I'm not shitting on Boss, but let's be honest here. Look at the mileage he got out of that pre-internet, pre-big broadcast day, right? It, it wasn't impossible. And in Canada, I don't think he had a lot of competition. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he had a lot of years before GSP came along, right? Um, and yeah. in those years, he was having, a, a, according to his wiki work, roofing jobs because he wasn't fighting anymore. You know, the karate schools were taking a dive because MMA went into prominence and he didn't have that, that title to dangle. I'm just saying, it, it could have, if things would have gone his way, maybe, maybe uh, you know, the hammer and the niece, the nephew thing <laughs> wouldn't have happened. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you were mentioning, like, um, <laughs> when you were mentioning, uh, like, Canadian like Canadian title, like belts in, in the UFC. I, I, I instinctively found myself thinking of Carlos Newton, who also had his own like, oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, brush with, uh, brush with greatness, where he was pretty, pretty fortunate that I think, as as Sonnen put it, you know, they woke, they woke Hughes up and gave him the championship. But yeah, yeah. like, I mean, I guess from the sheer amount of uh, crimes that happened after um, <laughs> later on in his life I, I guess it was just like the unluckiest thing was really that they they matched him up with a cop like that's just yeah. his his natural predator like, <laughs> yeah it, it's funny the promo package steve jenham goes i'm steve jenham and i'm here to bust harold howard <laughs> so uh yeah very very and and very, again yeah. and again because Prophetic. And because of those uh, things, he that's probably why he, he gets knocked down on the list for the crimes after. And, yeah, prophetic and, yeah, ironic, all of the above. That Steve Jenham, by the way, Phil, that previous page note, he was number one on my unlikeliest heroes list. So Harold Howard will have to, again, once again, concede to Jenham and take the number five slot. Makes sense. All right. What's your number five, sir? And my ranting on the, the that, that dude. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I was going for um, I was going for a bit of a classic. Uh, I think also like in terms of like setting up the the, the five, I went for a um, as I said, going for different types of unluckiness. And I think the uh, like one of the best kinds of unluckiness is someone who starts an MMA career and it's simply over before it begins. Uh, because they have to fight people that they have no chance of winning against, and mm. they're just like, man, I, I never want to even touch this sport again. And uh, I think there's, there's sort of two guys who I think have the worst records in MMA for this. Uh, we can get to the other one later, I guess. But one of them is uh, Yuji Nagata. Oh, uh, Yes. Yeah, because um, this was sort of in the um, the the Kakatogi boom in uh, in Japan, and this is really before the establishment of uh, and this is when you know works and shoots tended to blend, and as anyone who watched any old. Um, and indeed, for those who have watched uh, things like Gabby Garcia fights, recent uh, MMA, uh, Japanese MMA, 
uh, know that like there was a mix between shoots and works. Like you mm-hmm. would you would get uh, you, they would blend together um, pro wrestling and uh, actual fights. And often like there was a thing where it would be considered that people should, you know, that the pro wrestlers would kind of show their their warrior spirit by fighting actual like professional combat sports, uh, like professional fighters. So poor Yuji Nagata got put in with, in fairness, at this point, not the name that he would be later on. Uh, I think he was only three fights into his pro career. But um, Yuji Nagata got put in for his MMA debut against Mirko Krokop, uh, who knocked him out within, I think, about 18 seconds. Um, in, I mean, also, in, admittedly, in the way that would like go on to define uh, Mirko Krokop. And then um, later on, they brought poor Yuji Nagata, at this point, oh. zero and one, um, I think less than a year later, they brought him in for Fedor Emelianenko's uh, 18th pro fight. How kind of him. Yeah. Um, and yeah, both of those do not really go very well. Uh, and it's one of those ones where you want, like, a lot of the, the pro wrestling transfers did not often, like, do tremendously well in, uh, like, these areas but obviously you know there was there was sakuraba and so on but like he does not get much of a chance to do very much against um against poor against mirko krokop and fedor emelianenko i mean i think a grand i think fedor finished him off in about a minute with ground and pound and yeah mirko krokop was just the the old left leg cemetery and yeah, I think there's there's few people where you look at them and you just got thought you never even got a chance to try MMA like in the way that regular people do. You never even, like you never just got to fight regular people. You just had to fight these two guys and you decided that was it. Um and also that he probably I don't think he he particularly wanted to fight uh either of them either. I think this was one of these fights where he was like heavily uh like pressured into taking the bout. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, especially just especially the second time. Yeah, well, yeah, the the, the politics and stuff, you know, uh, in those days alone. Uh, I love this. If, if you don't mind me cutting in here and adding oh, yeah, on, I love this. I love this pick, by the way, because it it highlights more importantly, you know, kind of you pointed out this history of culture that, especially you know, with you know, uh, American North American audience. Uh, as MMA fans, audience, I should say, uh, understand about the difference between the Japanese MMA and how they looked at people. And it reminds me of like guys like, you know, like uh, I just actually shared something from this catch wrestling account um, on Funaki. And when I was, I forget, like uh, someone asked on MMA Junkie Radio back in the day, like what my Mount Rushmore would be for like Japanese MMA. And I would have guys like Funaki on there for early pioneers as far as transferring over from the pro wrestling to the pancreas days, so to speak, right? The early MMA mm-hmm. days, um, pre-pride folks, right? This is this is 90s. Um, and, and not that they wouldn't make appearances later uh, when they really shouldn't have. But when you go look at back at these records, um, and, you know, like Nagata's as well, it's just red. It's short and it's red, right? If you go to the topology. Um, because, it, and, and, and especially with how we grade, you know, uh, yeah, we, we talk about fighters, you know, today, like, oh, Anderson Silva was never good. or <laughs> You know, all these guys or whatever, like, because they're old, they suck, in other words. Like, good luck trying to get that audience to appreciate these guys when they go pull them up on a wiki or whatever, and they see their records, and they don't recognize most of the names, right? Because it was from mm-hmm. a generation prior. But these these were really important, not just for the promotions, but for MMA itself, for paving the way. Uh, for people to be unlikely heroes, whether they had legitimate careers like a Gomi, or they were able to make the shine um, with that moment the best they could, like uh, Takayama uh, opposite Don Fry, right? You know, we we joke now we're like, oh, it's real bad if a commentator is just oh, yeah. talking about your toughness, but this was before then, and this was different, you know. 
Um, I don't recommend any fighter go take that head trauma that Takayama did. That's not what I'm saying, folks. Um, I'm just saying you need to appreciate that that was a part of the culture. That was a part of the time. Yeah. Uh, anything uh, Anything else you want to add to that? Great pick, by the way, for number five. I like it. Um, yeah, I mean, not really. I mean, also that, also that kind of, um, that there's, that it ended up being this, this real inauspicious fight as well. Um, that it, it's not just sort of bad luck as, you know, for Nagata himself. Cause I think, you know, there's another guy I'll probably mention, uh, who has a similar record to Nagata and that he just, and sort of more of an unfortunate one in some ways, because, um, Nagata was, I think, fed to people uh, as mm -hmm. a as a spectacle. Yes, but yes. the other guy, the other guy just wanted to fight in MMA and just unluckily managed to draw future champions. True. Uh, but yeah. this was also inauspicious because I think this was the fight where um, where the uh, Inoki the Inoki Bombier on the, for the Fedor fight um, was the one where where they managed to um, they managed to pull Fedor away from Pride. And uh, this is um, this is essentially uh, like this became the start of the fall of pride because there suddenly people started coming out with allegations that people had been using Yakuza to pressure, you know, to pressure people not to pull Fedor away from pride. Like and then it started it affected the the broadcast, the broadcasting company. So like not only was this this singularly unlucky individual event, but it was also this, like, yeah, this, this, this omen. It was, this was the point at which, like, and in, in some ways, you know, Japanese MMA as a whole sort of fell after this incredibly silly fight because, um, because yeah, there was this, there was, this was when the, after, it was after this that the Yakuza That's accusations right. just got too strong. That's right. I came in as a more hardcore follower a bit, you know, after this more 2005 era. So I was late on the catch up of a lot of the Japanese scene, but yes, no, uh, in, in later going back. Yeah, no, that timeline is, it, 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 that timeline fits. Yeah, that that's quietly very appropriate. Wow. Fedor just beat Gary Goodridge before that and moved on to fight M Mark Coleman. You almost forget about it with the point of time it was squeezed in there. Mm-hmm. That's that's a fantastic choice. I'm glad we got some Japanese MMA in there. We got some early MMA. It's like, see, Phil, it's like your first time, and you're already falling in line with the show. You got the hipster pick early. <laughs> that's that's perfect. This one is a more of a typical pick for me, especially for those who know me. That being said, for those who know me, maybe they'd be surprised that perhaps Tony. I didn't put a Tony Ferguson a bit higher on my list. Um, I don't know if you have Tony on your list. I would not be surprised if you didn't, by the way. Uh, I, I don't think he'd be on most people's top five list. Um, I don't know how sympathetic he is to most people now or even during his most sympathetic times, but people I who... actually I actually have Tony Ferguson you in think? exactly this in exactly this spot. Oh, let's double dive. All right. Wow, so obviously you do have some sympathy for Mr. Ferguson, I take it. I do indeed, yeah. Um, Set it I mean, up. so he, he again, he wasn't going to be, a, he wasn't actually someone who I was considering at the beginning because, um, I mean, I've, I, he's, he's an interesting, like, part of this because he, there's such, uh, uh, you know, it's so inher in, inherently tied up with the Nomika Madoff fight that there's an argument that. There's an argument nowadays that, you know, especially now that Nemega made off retired looking undefeatable, that Ferguson was lucky to never fight Khabib because, mm -hmm. you know, he never, because he just would have lost. And I've been something that's, someone that's been, uh, like, picked against Khabib a lot. And I think I probably, Same. there's a solid chance that I would have picked against him incorrectly if he'd fought him. Ferguson. In fact, I think I might have done if we'd gotten through to the, you know, in the ones where we these fights got far enough um, to actually get, uh, like, for us to be actually writing previews for them. I think we've both been in this kind of situation. Yeah, totally, um, totally. But you know, in in retrospect, I think that's probably, you know, that was probably a pretty 
pretty bad call, and I've, I've at least taken the uh, one of the metrics that like don't bet anyone who st- struggled against Danny Castillo to beat uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov. I think that's one of my my became one of my rules of thumb after the Poirier fight. Um, but even then, like taking that into account, you know, maybe he just wouldn't have beaten him anyway, all that kind of stuff. It was taking a brief look at, back at like everything that happened in that uh, like five fight cursed run uh, where they tried to put those fights together. That was really what kind of uh, solidified it for me for Ferguson. It was the sheer amount of ways that the gods were just so determined that this fight would not go forward. And it was the way that, you know, I think, you know, the Gaethje fight, we've seen that out of, out of Ferguson. I think there's, the, you know, there's a, there's a solid chance that he simply never would have beaten Tony, uh, Justin Gaethje. Justin Gaethje is better than him and all this other kind of stuff. But I think this is all, there is also just a solid chance that Ferguson burned his prime on those, burned his prime waiting for Khabib. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's, it's just the, the shotgun like level of insanity, which I think sort of brought me to, to the Ferguson pick. Yeah, man. I mean, obviously the whole MMA gods, like there's almost no better example of that when you look at Khabib Ferguson. So for that reason alone, it warrants on the list, right? And I'll mm-hmm. spare the... I'll spare the audience of like going through the one by one of that. I think we all get the gist, but you said burning his prime and like that's the perfect words, Phil, because when I mean, you look at his entire career, you know, he gets in, he's 36 now and he's got a lot of miles for a 36 and you know, the Gaethje fight didn't help and doesn't project him in the brightest light. I get all that. Right. But you look at it, he enters the UFC off of tough in 2011, nine years ago. So 27 on the show, 28 entering the UFC, entering his prime. Um, he's only a pro for five, maybe six years, only in the middle of his prime at 30 years old at that Danny Castillo fight where I believe it's a really bad look, but I also w- believe he makes a big jump and kind of finds his style, so to speak. Uh-huh. And he goes on a run that, you know, I still contend he beat guys more impressively, even at the times they fought them, which was kind of the irky part of him not getting credit for the run. Also, for the technical part, the fact that he made weight every time and there were a couple of what, catch weights for Khabib, right? Uh-huh. And so it's like, and, and people always didn't bring those up. And that was always, you know, again, for contrarian Dan Tom and the way I'm wired just irked me, right? And, you know, he fights the guy that, you know, and he, he's fighting, he's fighting. Well, that was the complaint about Khabib. Even Khabib, ardent Khabib supporters were just, you know, especially for a certain stretch where, like, they couldn't defend it. Like, yeah, the guy never fights. I don't know. I don't know what to say, right? And in said time, he was talking trash and trying to fight guys like Donald Cerrone, who he never fought, but Tony Ferguson did when he had everything to lose, right? Um, and I know that's an older Ferguson uh, Cerrone, but if you look at it within that context, right, they couldn't put together. You, I was there covering it, you know, and it was more it was more on Pettis' side, obviously, than Khabib's. Khabib would have fought Pettis. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it didn't happen at UFC 223. So, you know, what does Tony do? He goes and dismantles Pettis at UFC 229 right under Nurmaga Madoff and, and McGregor, which kind of to the bad luck and the irony piece. I mean, how about that? We actually got them to show up on the same night. Yeah. Um, and the ironic part for me was, and I totally second you with these things, Phil, as far as like, I think we've picked against Nurmaga Madoff for the same ones, except I don't know if he picked against them last one. I, and it didn't matter. Uh, I actually was, because I, I can't take credit for picking them. I kind of like lost my right to pick against them in my own head. So I, I can't even, like, flex for picking him. Right? Not, not that I would. But um, <clears throat> the funny part was is, like, I second you with, with that. But And I also, even though I was, like, you know, when I broke the fight down from 2016, I was like, it, oh, Ferguson's the worst matchup for him. And then we would see things, and I would be like, oh, I'm still convinced. I'm still convinced. And, you know, we get the jabbing performance, which was, you know, kind of weird. You could, you could spin positive and spin negative from that RDA fight, right? That was always a weird sample size. Um, but you know, Kevin Lee, again, you could be like, Oh, Kevin Lee had, you know, these moments of success, which looked bad. But at the same time, if you understood that Tony's been, you know, dismantling guys by playing the long game up until now, um, and where, you know, where Kevin was coming in, missing weight and not having, you know, kind of having suspect gas tank to begin with. Uh, so we thought, 
I mean, it kind of made sense. Anyways, not trying to live and die in any of these hills, but the more time went on, Phil, the more I was like, you know what? Even though people aren't giving credit for Tony's advancements, I need to give credit to Habib's advancements, right? Which he kind of showed and reminded us of in the Gaethje fight, even though most of us kind of figured Gaethje wouldn't have much in the mat wrestling department or jiu-jitsu department, right? Um, but here's the ironic thing. I guess what I'm trying to say, Phil, is that people like me who have been a supporter of saying, like, Tony is the bad matchup for Khabib, even though I've kind of come off that in recent years, uh, I'm not that confident in that take in recent years. The people that I noticed are confident that Tony has nothing to give are kind of the same people that, whether they picked Gaethje or not, were like, this is going to be a difficult test because Khabib's finally facing a wrestler, which was the right question. Everybody... You know, everybody was, you know, you know, which was a right question, but everybody was looking maybe too much at that and not enough at, well, what happens if Gaethje faces a wrestler? And I'm, not, I'm not trying to rehash that matchup. The point is, everybody brought up that fact that, you know, oh, what if, what if Khabib faces a guy, you know, an MMA, you know, an MMA fighter with, with high-level wrestling and he's a top guy? And if you look back at Tony's career, he's kind of been facing those wrestlers all throughout. I mean, yeah, he didn't look great in that win against Castillo, but he dismantled Trujillo. Who had his mm -hmm. moments, you know, T Bow, uh, who's not a traditional wrestler, but I'm not gonna, you know, remind people of T Bow's wrestling ability, uh, you know, and, and you look at these things, and Michael Johnson, that one loss he had in that whole run, people forget and don't bring up too, like he got his arm broken early in that first round and fought through yep. it. Yep. Um, and Michael Johnson has his weird ability to get random wins, anyways, which would later be kind of flushed out. So, I mean, you really look at it like this guy had this crazy, insane run. And to back to your words, which you summed it up more than my long-winded ass, he burnt his prime out. Yeah, I mean, that was, I think, because that was the shame, the shame about the um, the Namagameda fight, really, um, is that, is that uh, Ferguson is one of those fighters that... Whatever had happened, he would have forced a fight. You know, yes. I mean, it, it might have, and it, I think it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic, especially perhaps more for the times when he would have fought Khabib than uh, the recent Khabib, because I mean, I think Khabib is already himself becoming the fighter where um, people are synthesizing the best elements of his run into one, because. He wasn't the sub guy that we're seeing now uh, in his earlier run. He wasn't getting people out of he wasn't getting people out of there one round faster every single time out like he has been lately. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, in a control and cardio fight, who knows what could have happened? But you know that like Tony Ferguson would have given, uh, you know, he would have never he would have never stopped. And that's and I think it's still you know I think it still would have been just an absolutely fascinating fight, a sort of. A legacy-defining fight, win or lose for both guys, uh, and it's totally. it's always like a one of MMA's great tragedies that we never got to see it. And I know you didn't list it, you didn't like list out the things that happened because people remembered them, but like, but like when you do go over them, you're like, I mean, okay, so the first one is a fairly standard MMA injury in 2015, like yes. Nurmagomedov injured injured with something. I don't think we ever found out why. It's probably you know standard things like rotator cuff or knee or whatever. I'm I'm not sure what it was. I can't remember. The second one. Ferguson's lung collapses on UFC on Fox 19. Yep. Uh, the third time is the infamous tiramisu weight cut uh, at UFC 209 for the interim lightweight championship. The fourth one is the most heartbreaking one, the UFC 223 one, where we were all so convinced it was going to happen. Um, or at least, no, we won. Uh, because I remembered, like, one of my friends was asking me, you know, when, when it was going to be. He was like, when's Khabib versus... Uh, Tony gonna happen I, I went like never probably never and I remember the, this was when I was doing like the artwork for our um, for our our bloody elbow previews and I did one I did the artwork of the two of them facing off with like uh -huh. Tony wrap Tony wrapped in bubble wrap and uh, <laughs> Khabib with like pillows taped all over him and it wasn't enough because Ferguson tripped over like tripped over a cable backstage oh, and like man snapped his thigh muscle or something was it always it a um it was it was a 10 it was a it was a sorry it was his fibula collateral ligament uh in his uh in his knee 
Um, and I've never even heard of that in as a sports injury before. And then obviously the last time was for UFC 249, uh, where they were stopped by a small thing called COVID-19 and the Russian travel ban. And so, yeah, just the, like, the sheer depth and diversity of the ways in which this fight got screwed over. Uh, I had to put Tony in there somewhere. I mean, now after, after all that, I feel like I should have Meyer on this list, but I'm glad we ended up on the same spot, Phil. That was, that was, that was perfect. And yeah, no, you said it great. Cause that's the thing. Like it doesn't matter who you would pick. The point was, it was an intriguing matchup because it, it, for everybody that was saying he, he, Tony would get smashed, they were like, Oh, if only could someone could fight off their back from with Khabib. Oh, if only someone could scramble with Khabib. And I'm like, that's the guy. <laughs> Not saying he'd win, but that's that's the guy. And he's he he has won against other legit wrestlers. So let's give it a shot. MMA, but the MMA gods said no, Phil. Let's take this for the Chinese fire drill, Phil. Um, why don't we use this chance to have you start off with number three, if you have that handy and ready to go? Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this is sort of one which is a, I think it's probably one that you might have picked already. You, you might, you might have picked as well, as I think you alluded to this, uh, we might see some people from this country later on in this list. And I think this one is, is a real heartbreaker for being someone who's potentially on the brink of greatness, or at least, you know, everything in their career was turning around until it suddenly wasn't. And it is, of course, uh, T.J. Grant. Yes, great pick. I, I have him on my list, too. Um, one higher. So I'm going to mm-hmm. go ahead and adjust it. But let's double dive into this and you continue on with your setup of T.J. Grant. Great pick. So Grant was uh, primarily came to the UFC as a uh, welterweight. And... A really good one, actually. Like a genuinely uh, tough, uh, like a genuinely tough fight for pretty much anyone. Um, I think he ended up having only like a few losses, and mostly real, real power losses. Like where he just got he just got overwhelmed by like Ricardo Almeida, another like super underrated guy from back in the day, and uh, Don Hyun Kim back yeah. when. Uh, back when stun gun still likes to still tried to grapple people um and like most notably he had this fight against johnny hendrix oh yeah which, like i don't think hendrix won yes yes i don't think like, so i just watched that this morning i don't think you won either go go on i mean it's but it's just a it's a banger of a fight yes, and it is. uh and i think in a weird way Grant ended up he he actually fought a lot like Hendrix like the way he would throw like these short hooks into like collar ties um just being this this physical force but he he just has this this kind of knockdown throw down this kind of knockdown brawl with Johnny Hendrix and pretty much beats him i think like Hendrix is really getting uh chewed out by uh who is it in his corner again is it is it Ricardo uh, Mark Laborio? Lehman, Mark Lehman. Or Mark, yeah, yeah. Come on, and, Johnny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Triangle. Sorry, he was the greatest. He, was, he would yell references. Yeah, yeah. Matthews BJ2. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Killing my listeners here. No, but go is, on. That is fantastic. Um, so, yeah. And, and they're just... Uh, they're, like, desperately trying to get Hendrix to go for takedowns in this fight. And Hendrix is just like, I'm winning. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Base, um, uh, 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 just just to add on to that, and I'll let, you, I'll let you continue on. But yeah, basically, this is one of those fights where it was it was interesting because it was like both guys. I don't know how many fights you could say this about Phil, where both guys hit their technical curve in the same mm-hmm. matchup, irregardless of who won and who lost. You could point to that fight and we're like, oh, this is where the two grapplers finally started getting comfortable with the art of Muay Thai. You know, when you look at, like, what they were doing, like, Johnny, Johnny Hendricks, even though he was reliant on his wrestling, right, it was, uh, it was like wrestling with control, TJ Grant would threaten, uh, Johnny Hendricks would get scared, kind of allow the get-ups, and then TJ Grant would hit damage-winning flurries that if he, you didn't already thought he won rounds one or two, you would have been like, oh, he stole the round, right? And, um, and, but Johnny Hendricks, to his credit, like he's doing things like he's returning kicks to his credit. Like every time he gets kicked, he's returning the kick and against, in an open 
in an open stance match, which is pretty impressive for like where he was at and where the sport was at, right? Um, so it was a really interesting matchup in that aspect. And then don't forget that third round, I don't have a problem giving to Hendricks. He okay. actually got enough control to probably win around even by today's standards. But it's funny because like Hendricks is getting lit, lit up so hard at the end of the first round that he throws like a super blatant shot that we've seen fighters get DQ'd and you know been have their like careers ruined for like GDR or Lombard who granted Lombard's not the cleanest player but you know what I'm saying like it's a really bad one even Hendricks was like I'm so sorry and the ref goes that's a warning and I'm like what the heck <laughs> and then like in the third round again it's an open stance matchup and it's like the most clear inadvertent low blow and it's like a barely a low blow to where it nicks like the bottom and the inside thigh and bottom it was like a, a bear, it was a glance. It was inadvertent. It was the most common foul, right, Phil? In the most common scenario, a low blow, in an open stance. What does the ref do? That's a point. <laughs> he takes a point from T.J. Grant. So Grant loses, and it it wouldn't have mattered sadly. Like Hendricks would have still won, twenty nine twenty eight as opposed to twenty nine twenty seven on two cards. And then there was a twenty eight twenty eight, which is why it's listed as a majority win. But not to cut you off and just, just the final on that, this matchup, what I noticed and going back to watch a lot of these matchups, Phil, and maybe you notice this when you watch older matchups where you're like, dude, there was a good argument for this guy winning. And remember like people saying, ah, oh, you're just sour, you know, your guy lost. But now if you like fast forward ahead of time, like whether it's like BJ George one or Hendricks, uh, TJ Grant, like how we're now rightfully emphasizing damage. Like, no, there were good cases. Those guys actually lost, lost some of those fights. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember going back and looking at it for like Hendricks tape study at some point, and just being like, "What? He didn't win this. Yeah. What's going on?" <laughs> like, and yeah, like one of the one of the most unfortunate, like just a little like taster of the un the unfortunate future awaiting CJ Grant. One of the only like the few people to get to get like a point taken for a a, a, a super common foul, like. Like that one time when they saved up a whole bunch of fouls, clearly, and then gave them all to, like, Alex Caceres at the same time. Uh, yeah. He, he, he got, like, two yeah. points <laughs> taken in a fight. Yes. Uh, I was like, man, this, this, is, this is extremely uncommon for this sport. And, and it, was funny because, it? it was funny because uh, it was Machida versus Shogun, UFC 113, this card. So they're in Canada. And the ref's last name is Chartier. So... Again, it's my, my classic thing, like referees, they're human, so they overcorrect the steering wheel, mm. even, even, if against, yeah. even against their own, their own guy. It's like, and he wasn't a popular ref, right? It wasn't like the old Chartier guy. This was a younger Chartier guy. Like, the old, you know that old Chartier guy who refs French-Canadian shows? He looks like he's about to, to croak right on the, on the mat. And I'm like, Jesus huh? Christ. Like, he looked old back in the day. I was watching some old footage. But this guy is probably like, nope, I, I'm not getting accused of bias today, Phil. I'm going to show it any chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, just to add on to your setup, like the Walter Waite thing was interesting because he faces like former middleweight who submitted Anderson Silva Rio Chonin as his debut fight, right? He wins the split decision rightfully because he was attacking more in a grapple heavy fight. And not only like is it like justifiable to lose to Dong Young Kim, because like the matchmaking is not kind. Like they're giving him submission savvy judokas, um, a southpaw judoka who could wrestle and have submission savvy and, and Kim, like. On paper, this is the not developed striker TJ Grant, right? Like, on paper, like, you couldn't be giving him worse matchups, you know? Um, they give him Kevin Burns, granted, which he, you know, was able to win, but that was kind of unlucky off Kevin Burns. He got, he suffered a legit low blow and then gets knocked out right after. Um, but Kevin Burns is a legit fighter, right? Like, he, he, you know, he fought guys like Anthony Johnson. I think he submitted, like, I think Juan Carnero off his back. He could wrestle. Like, he, he was kind of an underrated guy who could fight in all phases. Uh, then he gets Johnny Hendricks, again, another southpaw who can wrestle. Like, terrible matchup on paper, right? Um, mm -hmm. Julio Paulino, which is, like, should be a gimme fight, but that guy, of course, he's got good enough jujitsu to not get submitted, so it's just a boring decision that doesn't do anything for TJ Grant in a win. And then, it's like, you know what? Let's You know what we haven't seen, Phil? TJ Grant gets a giant grappler. We haven't seen that <laughs> yet. Let's give him Ricardo Almeida while, while we've got this momentum going. Like, while Ricardo Almeida, like, looks like a complete former light heavyweight <laughs> at the time. <laughs> I mean, it was like that time member like where they were like matching, like let's match, like, uh, with, uh, like let's match up wrestlers versus wrestlers or wrestlers versus Machida light heavyweight. Hmm. I'm sure yep. those matchups will be fun. 
like to where even when you got one where it was like a first round finish and a really good performance like Rashad Evans over Chael Sonnen, no one remembers that because it was an era where the matchmakers fucking drowned us with these boring ass wasting the last of these guys' prime in wrestler versus wrestler matchups. Sorry. I rant. think it's, it's just like this was, I mean, but at that point, that this was the point where everyone was worried about the main thing everyone was worried about was wrestlers ruining the sport. Like, uh, yeah. you know, Greg Jackson, evil Greg Jackson, and the rest <laughs> of the sport killers were going to be coming. And so they needed to ratch all the grapplers with each other. Kill so they'd off. take each, so they'd take each other out. And every now and again, like someone would match Edson Barboza with a wrestler. And then like, he'd get hit by an overhand, right? And they'd be like, Nope, Nope. The strikers will fight the strikers and the wrestlers will fight the wrestlers. And yeah. I mean, I mean, and, and weirdly enough, like they've they've continued that dynamic to like the modern day. You know, you're only you know, poor old Greg Gillespie. You know, had had to go and fight. Um, uh, what's his face? Like Kevin Lee. Um, you know, uh, the only uh, like your only route to the top if you're a um, if you're a wrestler is normally like through RDA <laughs> in either weight class. Yeah, exactly, totally. And speaking of the same dynamic, not to keep getting hung up on the Hendrix fight at UFC 113, but, like, Hendrix, that's the first fight where you see it, like, fleshed out. Because before then, they got their first TKO wins of their career, but it was, like, in the first round on the same card at UFC 107. Again, uh, TJ Grant defeats Burns, and then Johnny Hendrix, like, dusts Amir Sadala in, like, a couple seconds, right? And you're like, wait a minute, these guys are learning to strike? Let's see more of that. Like, nope, let's just be boring and lazy and pair winners against winners and wrestlers against wrestlers. Uh, but yeah. Um, then it goes into his lightweight career, right? And he, he kind of turns mm-hmm. and turns a new, uh, a new fold and we see his striking kind of come out and man, like I was really watching it. And like from his, like he was doing like the Damian Maya, like half guard get up games. Like he's doing a lot of the stuff as far as like, I guess for lack of a better term, functional MMA meta that we would see, um, kind of ushered in from that point of the decade on as, as, as we moved in, for, moved out of the yachts and into the, you know, whatever the hell you want to call it between now and then, right? But he was doing a lot of that stuff early, TJ Grant was. And then when we got into the striking, man, like you see early glimpses of it in the Hendrix fight where he goes from the double tie plum to the elbow. But then when mm-hmm. he's getting to like to the Dunham and the Wyman and the Maynard, like it's really slick. He, he's, he's confident enough in the single collar tie. And then he's smart enough to use the wrist control to pin the wrist down and then come over the top with that wicked right elbow. I mean, you just really see the guy put it together in the little phases. And it's this kind of stuff that me and you would nerd out or people like us, I guess, would nerd out on. But, like, it's definitely getting missed back then, right, Phil? Yeah, I mean, and he's another one of these strange, like, yeah, I mean, I think nowadays... I think even nowadays people can. I think people could look at guys like T.J. Grant. Uh, I mean, you know, there's people now who obviously do it better, but like you could, there's still lots of guys with who have good clinch games that cannot effectively access them. And this has always been like my, you know, one of my primary quibbles with John Jones is that he just like his clinch game is entirely either he's he's it's mostly him walking into people or they they run into him you know he has to kind mm. of do this zombie walk mm-hmm. like TJ Grant's ability to punch into clinches to turn strikes into collar ties like this kind of stuff was like it was really different back then and you could see how different it was because um guys like you know Evan Dunham like uh, uh by that point you know, had passed his own sort of, you know, era of being a prospect and yeah. was now, you know, a tough, a tough vet. He was just getting, he was just like kind of baffled by what was happening. Like that this man could go from strikes to hand fighting to, to the clinch and could like kind of flow between all those phases. And like Grant was also, you know, he was clearly someone who would, he had, even though he was sort of fighting as a striker here, He'd, he'd benefited from he he genuinely benefited from the weight cut because he had this you know he was able to develop this bullying physical style and it was a bullying physical style which was able to go you know toe to toe with with Johnny Hendrix and yeah. and a lightweight you know uh, there was there was sort of no one that we saw, saw that actually stood up to it 
Absolutely, and if people listening, if you want to just go back to watch one fight of TJ Grant's, go watch the Evan Dunham fight, hands down. It's mm, an, yeah, it's an amazing fight, and to further Phil's point, and I guess our choice here, like he, I would say that's the best Evan Dunham. Like his confidence is at an all time high. He's had enough camps with Ray Sefo to where his striking game, for what it was, was put together. You would argue his level changing takedowns were on point, and we're keeping him. Um, as a scoring threat in that fight to potentially eke out a split, but then that, that elbow and that damage and that bullying was too much, and you saw it take over, and, and Dunham was just swimming in it by the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, unfortunately, we, we, we kind of know what happens. Is yeah. that, uh Grant, I think he got, he picked up, so he, he beat Dunham, he be, beat Matt Wyman and Gray Maynard, which, I mean, admittedly... You know, these wins don't those those wins don't look great in retrospect, particularly because you know this was this was sort of when we were starting to realize that Gray Maynard was kind of shot. But I mean, he a got them out of there as well as you might have expected, and b people didn't know that Gray Maynard was in that kind of trouble. And I think this was one of the ones where, yeah. like, this was another one which where like, um, he broke. Maynard's confidence because Evan Dunham you you can't break you couldn't you can baffle him but you can't break his confidence but yep. uh Grant broke him but then yeah he got he got this uh concussion in training and it kept him out of a you know he was going to fight uh Ben Henderson for the title yeah and then Pettis stepped in instead of him and Pettis won and then he was going to fight Pettis but he st- I mean like he kept he basically and unfortunately, that was that was basically the end of TJ Grant's career. The concussion symptoms kept him out, um, and he never came back. He went to become he went to become a miner. I think he started his own um, jujitsu and like combat sports school. I think in, in Nova Scotia. Apparently, it's doing quite well. Um, but yeah, like he was just like I can't afford to. His, his concussion symptoms never went away enough that he could fight again, and. He's for me. He's one of these guys where he's also a guy where I've actually um, I've um, I've changed my mind a bit on him in the in the in the years since because mm. at the time I just thought you know he's not he's not athletic enough to hang with these top guys that he wouldn't beat a Benson Henderson or a uh, Anthony Pettis. He can beat an Evan Dunham because Evan Dunham's, you know, he's he's big and slow, and but he's he's just rough and tumble. T.J. Grant, he wouldn't have been able to like hang with these guys athletically. But then I think, like nowadays, I look back at it, I'm like, look at what someone did with just like rugged technical aggression relatively shortly after that, you know. Right. Well, look at what, what RDA did to yes. that lightweight division, and you know maybe that's all, all T.J. Grant needed was his chance. I mean. He beat, I think he beat Evan Dunham more clearly than RDA did, for example. Yep. Yeah. Oh, totally. Way more clearly. I think Dunham won that bias aside. And, and of course, my bias, I wanted Dunham to win the fight against Grant. But um, mm-hmm. it was just an amazing fight. It was so forgivable, right, even though Dunham was my guy. And, yeah, man, Same like man. Benson Henderson would have definitely been the toughest matchup from a point perspective. But the funny thing was, what he doesn't get enough credit for, obviously, you're familiar, Phil, is, is Benson's clinch. He's quietly one of the most busiest, creative, uh, whether you like the style or not, clinch fighters, and he uses it effectively for his style when he needs to. Um, so to see a guy you know, that would be welcoming him and have his own threats, it's like, yeah, if he would have won, maybe he would have won like that RDA parallel. And off pressure alone, I already liked him to beat Pettis back, back in those days. But going back and looking at him more with more refined eyes now, I'm like, oh, man, he would have. I could totally see the moment like when RDA hit Pettis in round one with that left hand with the speed, you know, the one that he, that he claimed broke his orbital. Like I could have totally seen that same moment happen with TJ Grant Pettis where he goes, oh, my gosh, this guy can strike with me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the main thing against Grant in those matchups is that he didn't have the the command of range that RDA did. He didn't mm. have basically the yeah. the body kick and the low kick to work yeah. with. He was mostly just like uh, the occasional teep and the occasional low kick. But he wasn't, you know, the, he wasn't the classic Cordero style. But even then, you know, again, it's another one of these things where, like, like Ferguson, you just would have loved to see it, no matter what what happened. You know, Grant would have given whoever it was a hell of a fight. 
and, and as we move forward uh, to the list, it just even regardless if those things would have happened or not would have happened, that's the ultimate irony to ultimately circle back one last time to that UFC 113 fight with Johnny Hendricks. Is at least he could have said, "Hey, I got to win over a former champ." Yeah. And, right, true. And uh, that kind of ties into my my original number three, which I guess I'll jump into now as my number two. Is we'll, we'll shift things around. You'll do your number two next, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and maybe we'll, you'll do your number two at the same time because this is one I got to imagine there's crossover. Just on topology alone, this next selection has twelve canceled bouts. Do you probably already know the can- the fighter I'm talking about, Phil? I am pretty sure I do. Go ahead and guess. Drum roll. Uh, Ian McCall. You are right, sir. No need. <laughs> That's right. We, we winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's right. And then I also have my notes here. <laughs> Robbed at UFC on FX two. Um, not mm-hmm. by the typical form, by the way, folks. It wasn't like a bad twenty nine twenty eight or a bad fifty forty five. I'm not talking about the normal robberies, which I'm not one to use that word for what it's worth. Uh, for the most part, I'm talking about like the failure to do basic math or, arith- or arithmetic type of robbery um, by the Australian Commission uh, to cap off. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, bad luck, I mean, again, I mean, you want to talk about wheelhouse of unlucky. Everyone, everyone's saying, oh, we, the UFC should do a tournament. Like, folks, have you ever seen what happens when the UFC does tournaments? <laughs> there is no champion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, remember that. Remember the or remember the that fantastic Strike Force heavyweight tournament that got won by uh, some fat wrestler that no one had heard of. Uh, uh, or the, mean, un, the unkind Black Fedor uh, references that were being thrown around at the time. Yeah, I mm-hmm. remember. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, everyone knows uh, I got a soft spot for Cormier, but yeah, man, like you know, the, the, how about the failed lightweight tournament, right, with Matt Sarah and like uh, BJ and Cal Uno and Din Thomas? Remember that? Oh yeah, that produced a lot. Of, that produced a lot of rewards <laughs> as well. I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't work for them, man. And um, it happened there with Ian McCall, who famously, for folks that don't remember, uh, ended the fight um, back mounted and uh, playing to the audience as he punched uh, Demetrius Johnson, and even though Brad Pickett, who I uh, like and I'm a fan of, can put a feather in his uh, stylish cap that he likes to wear, of holding a win over Demetrius Johnson, it would have it, it would have it would have uh, w- paled in comparison to the win that Ian McCall could have pointed to, even if the rest of his career ended up still going as unlucky as it did. Right, Phil? Yeah, I mean, so I've. I'm trying to remember what actually were the rules in this tournament because I'm pretty sure. So with this particular fight, there were two sort of fairly close rounds. I think there was like, um, I think I remembered scoring the first two rounds for Johnson, and then he yeah he just gets absolutely clobbered in the third. It is a crystal clear ten eight, mm-hmm. uh, which I th- I think yeah. And so the problem was that this was actually like this was a weird majority draw, yeah. um, like or at least it should have been. And at this point, I think under the current rules, they would have fought a fourth round. Yep. I don't think there was any doubt what would have happened in that fourth round yes. if if it had gone forward at this time. So like, yeah, not only uh, yeah the strange scoring, um, and but. I mean, at least the UFC, to their credit, did did run this fight back. But with Demetrius Johnson being Demetrius Johnson, he just decided, oh, right, I should learn how to wrestle between these fights, and then did and won. Uh, he's just like, <laughs> yes. other people can't improve their wrestling like this between fights, but I can. I'm Demetrius Johnson. Three months later. And, yeah. And uh, this... Yeah, so, like, I mean, McCall would have gone on to... Uh, I mean, he would have won the first flyweight fight in UFC history. He would have um, had that on his belt. He would have won... To, he would have beaten Demetrius Johnson, like a future Hall of Famer and the future greatest fighter to ever go into that weight class. Uh, I'm not sure he would have beaten Benavidez in the finals. In fact, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have just because he wasn't the right style matchup for him. Yep. Um, but, yeah. But, I mean, then... Like, what happened afterwards... I mean, it's just unfathomable. The sheer amount of awful stuff that happened to... to I mean, uh, it's the thing. There's 
there's many like just regular old oh he withdrew due to MMA injuries right. but the amount of insane stuff that happened to Ian McCall I mean uh, so he had a blood infection which kept him out versus John Lineker uh, when he did get to fight John Lineker John Lineker obviously being John Lineker at flyweight came in fat and beat him uh, like uh, after coming back on him after losing the early going um what were the other like oh well, yeah like, he, he, uh after that the it's like he went on bingo between the viral infection that you quoted to uh after you know losing to uh dj he's supposed to fight john moraga but gets like a knee injury his next mm-hmm. injury is a hand injury which can be reoccurring uh, problematic in all combat sports but if a knee injury isn't like bad for a flyweight who needs a lot of footwork, he goes on and tears his groin and his hip when he's supposed to fight Brad Pickett, UFC Fight Night 37. And then his next one, of course, is the one Phil cited, that blood viral infection. Like, was he playing bingo with like what he could get? I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't even be the last thing he lost. He the last fight he had to pull out of due to illness. Oh no, it, it steps up after this. Like, yeah. It, yeah let, let me let me read through. It goes it goes Dustin Ortiz. Uh, undisclosed injury injury and this one wasn't him it was the other guy but like this falls under bad luck because it's like a guy like justin scoggins weight cut issues like yep. a stunt puller like justin scoggins right and then uh, i don't want to step on him too much uh, in case he ends up more on this list but i'll just leave it at a more sympathetic stunt <laughs> uh, not stunt pull that's an unkind word to use but you know a guy who's got his own history ray borg we'll just leave it at that yep but then even guys who don't have a history, and I still consider this bad luck, like, next one it says, Neil Siri, like, Neil Siri withdrew, like, illness. Like, Neil Siri looks like he lives off of dirty tea and rocks. And no offense, yeah. Phil, and I'm not, I'm not saying that man, that extends to your, your part of the world. Eats, <laughs> it's the man who clearly eats cigarettes for breakfast. Like, like what, what could have discouraged Neil Siri from fighting that day? <laughs> like, an, yeah. Ir- an Irish guy who eats cigarettes and, you know, drinks grainy tea and just lives off of that. Like, come on now. <laughs> yeah, it was the fact that like they booked these two guys up, and then McCall pulled out due to injury, and then Siri pulled out as well. And you were like, like when McCall did it, I remember being like, oh yeah, I guess we should have expected it. And when Siri pulled out, I was just, oh my god, <laughs> it's like this, he truly is cursed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you can always depend on a good, sa- a good scrap from Neil Siri, man. Like. And then Jared Brooks, he has uh, uh, the illness, um, you know, yep. m- 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 then faces Manal Cape uh, later on in the year at the end, and Risen gets the loss due to the facial cut caused by the knee. Yep. And, you know, it's not like uh, we expected, you know, we're surprised with what happened in the Horiguchi fight, were we? No, not, not at that point, but it is like, it's a real capstone, isn't it? Like... <laughs> It's a, for for a, yeah. a, a, both a career and a run, it's like fight this guy who was coming up when you, uh, you know, when you were just like leaving the, the lightweight the flyweight division, and yeah, I mean McCall, like many of the, um, like many of the uh, flyweight division, he had like a, there was there was a real sort of feeling of the ufc guys defending their turf in this particular um case because uh, they had been bantamweight crossovers Mm -hmm. uh of the you know the johnsons and the uh benavidez and then you had you know the other guys from like tachi and so on like um you know daryl montague and juicy formiga and and ian mccall and like that fight against demetrius johnson was the one to really like assert both you know McCall himself and the sort of wider flyweight ecosystem these guys had been ranked as the best in the world and they were the best in the world but you know in the end it wasn't to be because he couldn't because you know not even yeah like you said not even regular bad judging just people losing the goddamn scorecard or like and yeah it started off I think what has to be for for my money just the most concertedly bizarre uh, run of awful luck I think I've ever seen in this sport. I mean, even before the UFC, he was beating guys like Daryl Montague, Dustin Ortiz, Juicy A. Formiga. Again, mm-hmm. but you have to be a hardcore to be watching Tachi Palace to know like 
how many points this was worth. But when he got more like vocal things, he had to go up to, to, to Bantamweight to do that. And, you know, they gave him guys like Dominic Cruz. No big deal in his prime, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, the bad luck there. Did 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 closing the book on Ian McCall, did he make your list officially? Or I, I, I forgot. Did uh, I think I, I actually had him at number one. Oh, just shit. because of okay. that sheer yeah. volume of insane things that happened to him. Shit, I sunk like, battleship. I'm sorry. Not, that's no worries. <laughs> he's the... I think he's the like he's not he's not as sad as I think. I think I, I probably underrated T.J. Grant because thinking about it now, like I, I should have I should probably have him higher. So he's not as sad as some of the other ones, but uh, like just the sheer like machine gun volume of, of just being absolutely convinced that something has cursed this man. Yeah, I've and even... never seen anything like it. And even outside the octagon, like, and I don't, you know, everyone goes through this. I get it. But at the same time, I think people need to be reminded that these fighters are human beings. And as much as it sounds like a petty excuse, but, like, relationship stuff can really affect fighters. I mean, you know, uh, even, you know, uh, you know, Rogan, who's been around the game forever, will cite times where he's like, I've seen it. I've seen, he's, I've seen the things that go on behind the scene, you know, and it translates to, uh, you know, you got a crazy relationship. You're not getting the best fights. Uh, you're not getting the best preparation. And around this time as well, he uh, went through like some really big, like, you know, some bad dispute or something like that or whatever. And yeah, man, that stuff can, you know, mess you up. And, you you know, and I'm not going to speculate on to where Ian McCall is or what kind of guy he is. Uh, I'm sure he's naturally weird. I'm weird as well. So no hate, no judgment. But yeah, I mean, you kind of you let's just say, you know, you're, the, the personal life and the personal things tend to parallel um, the record in some way. So, yeah, the guy had had sounded like he didn't have the greatest luck in a lot of senses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I think I think he had, like, a pretty wild uh, childhood as well. I mean, not childhood, but, like, youth. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I think famously he was involved in, like, gangs of posh, of, like, rich kids who used to... Um, who used to like attack other? Who used to attack people? I think. Um, so maybe we, he might not have been the best guy, but you know, whatever karma he uh, in, whatever karma he sort of picked up in that, yeah, in that period of his life, it seems like it was paid back and then some over the course of his his UFC career. Yeah, he certainly paid that bill. Well, I'm interested to see who your um, number two was. Uh, I'm a bad podcast, so should I? Does that mean I should go with my number one, or should we hear? Uh, uh, hear... No, let, let's save your number one for the end. Okay. I'm I'm now very curious. Okay. Um, All right. Um. So, my number my number two, um. And again, I think in, in retrospect, I might swap him with T.J. Grant just for the sheer like tragedy of T.J. Grant. Um. Is uh James Urban. Cause... Ah, yeah, Hans Sandman. Yeah, because I, I feel like I got to get some uh, I got to get some slapstick in there, uh, as well as like just some 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 tragedy. Yes. Um, yes. Jeez. And like Irvin managed to like combine these things, unfortunately for him. <laughs> um, so, I think you know in general he was a like fun archetype of the of the sort that we don't. We just don't really see nowadays as much because they're, you know, not to be cruel to him, but they're sort of more um, put out onto the the regional scene. And that he was just a fun like banger, oh, yeah. um, at, who primarily like got known for um, destroying Houston Alexander mm -hmm. and um, sort of wrecking what was making people realize that perhaps Houston Alexander was 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 not not in fact for real. Um, but you know, he would but I think, you know, the first thing which gets him onto this particular um, was onto this particular list was when he was fighting in Strike Force, in his one and only fight in Strike Force, and he was fighting Bobby Southworth. Oh yes. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, oh, the two I of forgot them. about this. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so the two of them were clinched up and like went barreling into the cage, and 
the cage officials had not offic- had not actually locked the cage door. So the two of them fell out of it, and uh, the fight ended up being a no contest. Um, and unfortunately, James Irvin, like, he injured his knee doing this, which I think yes. would be like a con- a um, a uh, like an injury which would, un- like, you know, like Ian McCall would would follow him throughout his career. Like, this was not only the one of the dumbest things I've ever seen happen in MMA, but uh, like, yeah, sort of would be the albatross which would haunt him in some ways. Um, so yeah, he, he fell out of the cage against uh, Bobby Southworth, and I think people like booed Southworth because like Southworth was like maybe thought that he'd won because uh, Irvin like was clearly more injured than he was, but that's not how MMA works. Um, but yeah, so he would then go on. Uh, he would fight uh, Tiago Silva, and his knees would explode um, again. Again, sort of in, in, uh, indicating that, that that Southworth injury was staying with him. Yep, yep. Um, and then in a sort of brutal uh, turnabout of the whole knee thing, he would fight uh, Luis Carne, yes. another one of uh, another one of the like forgotten prospects where everyone was like, "Oh my man, is this guy super good?" From yesteryear, yep, where yep. like then everyone realized, oh no, Luis Carne can't see left hands at all. He's nope. just there, and they just like come at him like he's like he's totally blind to them. Um, so yeah, he fought Luis Carne and then got kneed in the head uh, when he was on the floor, I believe. Uh, so he sort of won that, but in the most you know in the most uh, horrifying. Um, in the most kind of, you know, the way that you don't want to, the one yes, where you're dizzy totally. and you're unconscious. Um, and then I think, you know, then he would just go on the sort of standard uh, UFC, like, bad run. But it really has to be, like, the, the one thing you don't want to do on your bad run when you're going going to go out of the UFC is to be on the Anderson Silver highlight reel. Yep. And it was a particularly highlighty one. This was the one where I think he, he tried to bless him. He tried to body kick uh, Anson Silva, who just caught it and then instantly murdered him. Oh, I remember that. I remember doing the channel switching with, with, with friends because that was the same night Affliction was on. Uh, so we were, which will actually tie in later here. But uh, so we were, we, were, we were channel jumping back and forth. And yeah, he just got styled on by Anderson Silva. And he had the scariest weight cut to middleweight, man. He looked like an alien. Remember when he oh, cut God, to Alessio yeah. Sakara? It was like him and Rich Franklin on Rich Franklin's like last fight against Kung Lee, which makes even less sense because Franklin's made the weight before, obviously. But Sakara, this or this one time he went to go down to middleweight, like, dude, I didn't even recognize James Irvin on the photos. It was. Oh yeah, it is what like. It is some machinist shit. You are right. I had totally forgotten about that. His eyes almost look of... black, like he's like from Thirty Days of Night or something, too. It's like he looks d- disgusting. Yeah, I mean, it is one of the most viscerally hideous machinist-style weight cuts I've ever seen. I'm trying to think of ones which are as bad, like maybe, maybe like McGregor Aldo, but even then, yeah. Uh, um, like yeah, it, it is. It is legendary. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot that. That is a that is a fantastic shout. I mean, there are some that like. I think you'd have to be in person. Obviously, like Rogan constantly always abuses the Travis Luter example, but like I think that was more of an in person one too. But these there are some that just doesn't matter from your perspective. It just looks bad. Um, and then with the Bobby Southworth mention, I love it too because I was recently thinking about this. Not, I don't know how recently. You know, it's hard to tell time in twenty twenty. But isn't that how Todd Duffy um, lost his last fight booking? And it was, and ironically enough, it was actually at like the UFC gym uh, where he was training and then fell out of the cage and hurt his knee in a training bout. No one secured, someone didn't secure it properly. And it was like, oh yeah, it was in like the UFC gym of all places, or like the PI or something like of all places. Like, holy shit! How about that luck? Shouts yeah, to Todd, Todd Duffy. Duffy. Yeah, Todd Duffy definitely deserves to be in the honorable mentions. <laughs> yes. Oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, for many, many reasons. Many reasons. Many reasons. <laughs> Otherwise, we're giving him a spot here. No, that's a great. 
that was a great pick. I wrote you down for James Irvin at number two. I'm glad he got mentioned because he wasn't he wasn't on here in my honorable mentions, and he absolutely deserves to be. So, um, well, that, yeah. I mean, it was it was also that like after that silver fight. I mean, he he also popped painkillers, right? It was a, like the the Ian McCall thing. Yeah. He, um, he was um, like I think it was uh, you know from the Southworth injury. He'd been it, it had been nagging him, and weirdly enough, like it does seem that painkiller addiction was either something that they were better at keeping under the table back then or just something which was more common back then you know if you think of you know Irvin and um uh Caro um and guys like that yeah, Caro, yeah. Caro obviously yeah. another 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 guy yeah. like that um but yeah uh so poor James Irvin like gave us a num like and I get again, like not as tragic as many of the others, but like for the sheer weird physical array of things that he gave us, he, he got to my number two. It's hard, right? Because it's like like in life, but especially in MMA, so much of this is self inflicted, right? So you have to parse that out. But that's an absolutely solid choice. Um, number one time, Phil. Uh, I, I teased a little bit with some affliction. Uh, and I believe I did another page note, which I'm sure will come up organically as I unveil. But aside from the bias uh, that that will be at play with this pick, um, I also ended up deciding for him on number one, even though there are some objectively sadder things, like I think you've hinted to with the TJ Grant, and I, I definitely understand what you're saying, and he initially was going to be my number one. Uh, TJ Grant, of course, was officially my number two. But the reason why my number one beat him out is because he never got a win in the UFC. He has wins in Legacy, Affliction, Bellator, Strike Force, the IFL, uh, the WEC, Ring of Combat. I mean, that's quite the list. I mean, he pretty much everywhere minus the Japanese scene, right? And that is Jay Haran. Mm. Super hipster, but again, even Harold Howard, as hipster as Harold Howard was, even Harold Harold how even Harold Howard's ass has a UFC win, right? Everyone on our list, even James Irvin, as unlucky as he was, even though he had to get kneed in the face to get maybe one of those wins, he has a UFC win. Jay Heron, who was the thoroughbred for obvious reasons because he came up boxing and wrestling, you know, uh, had his buddy Phil Baroni, which maybe you could perhaps blame for those training sessions as some of the outcomes that we saw happen with Heron, maybe one of his weaknesses, right? You know, I don't want to spell it out. I like the guy. Um, Jay Haran, of course, is an extreme couture alum. When I when I signed on, so I saw him there. He was teaching classes along with um, Eric. What was his name? He was Frankie Edgar's first fight in a warehouse. But uh, he trains the guys over in San Diego, and I like Jay Haran, man. And 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 he was a mean guy. He was the guy that would greenlight people in the gym um, because he was one of those fighters like his buddy Pyle. You know, where, where like. Usually you saw the best guy in the gym, but even then, you know, he was still good. He goes 4-0. Then he finally, he gets rushed to the UFC, almost like Contender Series style, right? Which that was the page, the previous page note. I mean, how much of a pain in the ass to see these guys getting UFC contracts and wins, all these Contender Series people for the for the reasons why hardcore fans pull their hair out? Imagine how Jay Haran feels, the road he had to fucking go. And he still didn't get the damn UFC win because they give him a, a, a guy named George St. Pierre. <laughs> At UFC payback for his first fight, right? And he's doing pretty good and then gets just... This is when George is striking without fear, folks, by the way. Uh, you know, uh, this is on George's first climb to the title. <clears throat> um, and he gets and he gets just, you know, kind of caught cold by, by GSP. Goes back, goes and fights a Hawaii regional. Talk about fighting everywhere, right? Fights Ronald Jun. I mean, for the old school names. Beats Ronald Jun. Gets over to the WEC, beats Adam Lynn, beats a guy named uh, Pat Healy in IFC over there. Uh, then he gets to a guy named, you know, Jonathan Goulet. The UFC gives him another shot and gives him Jonathan Goulet. And people are like, wait, Jonathan Goulet wasn't that the guy who just, you know, got like records set on him, was known for not having a chin, um, all these things? Yes. But he loses to Jonathan Goulet. And how he loses is so unfortunate because if John Shorley being the ref isn't enough of a bad omen, <laughs> like, how about that for a name? There's another throwback name. Like, <clears throat> Jay Haran's actually lighting Goulet up and, like, doing really well. He's showing really good wrestling that would translate well to today's standards. 
and be impressive as a welterweight of today. And he's doing it back in 2005, like 15 years ago, folks. This is like a really dated broadcast. There's barely anybody in the hard rock, right? And he's wrestling his ass off, winning rounds clearly, rounds one and two. But in round two, Goulet, like, it might be the only shot he lands in the round. Um, and it cuts Jay Huron open to where it's bleeding so horrifically right from the start. In the replay, you actually see Goulet. Instead of following up, Goulet turns pale and starts backing up and pointing to the ref going, hey, you see that? You see that? And, of course, John Shorley's yeah. like, keep going. And they end up swimming in what still might be the... I don't think that, you know, a lot of things don't age well when you go back. Like, this is the bloodiest fight in our UFC history. Uh -huh. You're like, well, it's been 15 years, I'm sure. Like, no, this is probably still the bloodiest fight. This canvas still hangs, folks, in one of the warehouse rooms at Extreme Couture Gym, the main room. Um, this very canvas. It just got soaked. These guys were swimming in blood. Goulet said he could taste the blood. They, the, the, the doctor let it go the first time as best he could, but once it got into the third round, it got too bad after Goulet landed a couple shots, and they had to stop it. And I'm a guy who, I don't know if you can relate to this, Phil, because you, you seem to have an affinity for the technical guys. Like, the rounds that, regardless of if, if there's a fighter bias, whether I picked, whether I bet it, it doesn't matter. The most painful way to see a guy lose, so to speak, is when he's doing, he's winning the majority of the round being more technical in all phases, but the other guy just does athletic, big move and wins the round. Yeah. I hate that shit. Mm -hmm. Even when it's fair, even when it's just fully that the, the damage should win, I still hate it. You, you get where I'm saying? You, you get where I'm coming from there, Phil? Yeah. And it's got, I mean, it, it's real rough when it's, it's like someone like Huron, who's, I think, you know, known for like, being te one of these guys, like, real technical, maybe he never had, like, the best chin or the most firepower, I think, probably the two things. He wasn't mm. even knocked out by it, but yeah. This was the fight, I, I think that Goulet fight, they refused to they refused to broadcast that, right? Yeah, I wrote in here, um, blood in Goulet fight, and then I wrote in parentheses advertisers, um, because you could totally imagine, like, this is, they're on spike, like, uh, Goldie's like freaking out in the commentary. He's like, we're on spike, baby. Like, and he's saying it with like, uh, yeah. I can't believe we're fucking airing this. And even Rogan, yeah. is, and Rogan, of course, being too honest for his own good, uh, which is why you also say what you will about him. You can't accuse him of being a company guy because he will go out and straight up say shit that's like really bad for the broadcasting company. And he was like, this is gross. They need to stop this. You know, for everybody saying that this is a human cage fighting, again, folks, this is 2005. It's not too far from that era. He's like, everybody who's saying this is human cage fighting, all the politicians, all the commissions, they can now point to this fight and use it for firepower. I'm like, Joe, don't give the enemy that, that much strategy <laughs> points. Let's, like, you could totally tell, like, I don't know how advanced production was, but they had to have been in his, in his ear doing the, the Jonah Hill gif, like, oh, cut, cut, come on, Joe, Joe, stop. <laughs> Like you could see yeah. the advertise, and you could like see Dana White, like just thinking, like doing the math in his head of the advertiser money being lost because they just. This is the first year on Spike, folks. Two thousand five, like tough just happened, <laughs> and they're coming out here, and bleeding all over the cage. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they genuinely did pull it from like any like they never yep. rebroadcast that fight until it just got you know uploaded to Fight Pass. Yeah, it didn't make the UFC unleashed in years to come, right? But he goes in this really good run in IFL, only loses to guys like Black, Brad uh, Blackburn or Chris Wilson, who are um, UFC vets, beats guys like Delson Heleno, right? Uh, beats Jason High round one, beats Jesse Taylor. Puts together like a quiet, and people forgot too, he was one of the guys that was making his, a quiet argument to fight Nick Diaz. People forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Because he was ending um, on a nice little two-fight strike force winning streak, but like a big winning streak overall, including an IFL title that he never lost. So he loses his chance to fight Nick Diaz. The It gets sold. I don't know what the negotiation is like. He ends up over in Bellator during their tournament series. The dude, you know, gets a decent a decent draw for what was Bellator had and for what the MMA had at the time. Beats Rick Khan by split. Then he goes on to face Askren, and before Askren gets to the UFC, you know, even including, you know, Maybe, you know, I know Alex Shockin obviously gave him a tough fight later in his career and won. But, like, you could always point to that Jay Haran fight. It was one of the toughest fights where you could argue, you know, make an argument he won. Of course, I'm super biased. But, like, Jay Haran, who showed a good left hook early in his career, 
Now he's working with Gil Martinez in his boxing, so he's rolling under his crosses. He's throwing jabs. But what's he doing, Phil? He's fighting technical, he's countering, and he's fighting backwards. We know how MMA judges, even today, with all their knowledge, we know how well they score those fighters, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember. I remember that one. Because, um, yeah, that was, that was the one where, like, and I think, I think Askren is, in general, like, he's a bit... Uh, again, I think he, he's one who's been uh, unfairly maligned. I mean, because of his personality and where he came from and so on, and because of the way that his, his career ended. But, like, this was a, that was a super legit... Uh, that was a super legit performance from Huron. And, like, you know, beating guys like, um, like Lima and like... Um, Hornbuckle and all these other blokes that that like Askren went through was not easy even at the time. Like Koreshkov is yeah. not someone who is traditionally easy to out wrestle. Yeah, like not only did uh, Huron like arguably beat him, but he just held him to a. Uh, he just he just made he was one of these Askren was one of these guys where he had just sort of had the Khabib thing of just. He was going to play his game, and Huron forced him to just look like a regular MMA fighter. Yep, yep, and and and, and you know to Askren's credit, and what people don't bring is like Huron forced Askren. This was when Askren like was still trying to be an MMA fighter, like before he gave up and was like, "I'm just going to stick to wrestling." So mm -hmm. in this performance, he actually forced Askren to reach deeper into his bag of tricks, arguably than he's ever had to in his career as a whole, even till today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he goes on, gets a win in Legacy, which now is LF, people know as LFA after it merged with RFA. He gets a third chance in the UFC as I'm closing off this pick finally, folks. But he gets a third chance in the UFC, Phil, in the audience. And it's at a little event called UFC 151. John Jones, when he fought Dan Henderson. You guys remember that? Ah, uh, yes. No, because it didn't happen. <laughs> <What> <laughs> that, a, it was... Yeah, what a legendary performance that was. <laughs> the event was canceled. This, you know, before coronavirus, this was one of the only events you could point to as far as, you know, um, at least, you know, the uh, post-SEG era as far as, like, canceled events, right? Um, and which was a big deal at the time. Of course, we remember Bones getting a lot of heat, not the most sympathetic character. Um, and it sucked because, you know, it robbed Hendo, even though, you know, it would have been an elder abuse, still robbed him of a title, sh title shot. <laughs> um, but they rebooked the fight, which... Always plays havoc, right? Because now they rebook it. Now the momentum kind of feels off, right? They rebook it the same year, just like a month later. So the guys have that weird extended camp. Um, but they give him somebody that he already beat in the IFL named Jake Ellenberger. Uh, but it was one of those performances again where, and I, again, I, you could argue that Hiron retired at the, r the right time because even though this doesn't read as a KO loss, the reason why he lost these close rounds is because even though the archetype, like I said, he did more technical stuff all around. He did more duration-wise, but Ellenberger had the bigger moments, and it sadly didn't take the hardest or the cleanest shots to give the impression of those moments or that Huron was hurt. Um, turns into kind of a bad third round. That was a clutching round, and all three judges, of course, see it 29-28. And uh, they give him another shot, though, against a guy named Tyron Woodley. Making his debut, I believe, at this time. <laughs> uh -huh. And little did we know that Tyron Woodley was actually going to bounce back from a devastating loss and um, turn in the best chapter of his striking to in their fourth to become, in route, uh, another champion that Haran would lose to prematurely. <laughs> and then his career stops there. 0-4 in UFC swings. Yeah, I mean... Now go look at all the Contender Series fighters. Sorry, that, that's the end of my rant. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was... Uh, like, every one of his, his UFC fights was just, like, really characterized by just fighting against powerhouses. Like, they even... They, they tried booking him against, like, then pretty much prime Eric Silver as well, right? Yeah, yep. They were Eric just Silver, like, yeah. let's see how this slightly fragile technician just functions against this athletic brute and you know jake ellenberger slightly probably another guy might be slightly lost to more recent history i think still 
maybe the biggest puncher I've ever seen at welterweight. Like, yeah, did that? Uh, was it the Nate Marquardt finish? Um, that, am I thinking correctly? Or am I thinking of Lombard's finish? Yeah, I think I, I think that was one of them. But he was just one of those guys who could just hit people, and it didn't look like it was much, and then they just died. And, and that's the ironic part about this sample size, because to your point, this was the prime Ellenberger for people like, oh, yep. what that guy? But it was weird because he just came off of losing to Campman, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, remember where there's the comeback win when Campin was on that weird comeback stretch? So you got the classic oh, yeah. MMA fighter overcorrecting with conservativeness and br- yeah. bringing a stinker fight into a stinker fight before it even could become a stinker fight, in other words. So the fight was doomed from the start with Ellenberger's conservative approach. <laughs> mm-hmm. So he couldn't even get a good dance partner, much less a win or a chance to win. Like, it was... I mean, talk about, <laughs> you know, unfortunate draws. So... Jay Huron obviously is, is a soft spot for me, and and whether or not you would put him on your list, much less this high, you got to say he does offer a unique sample size of the winless UFC records. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, definitely someone who who deserved who deserved better. But I mean, at least he's also someone from an era where like an outside the UFC record is still a super legit thing to have. Like, still has a ton of you know a ton of a ton of solid wins on the record, you know, including Alan Berger himself, Pat Healy, uh, that, um, the Jason high fight, you, the Jason high win you mentioned, like, I think it's, it's one of those things where like, it's very sad. Like it's sad that he never got that win, but I think, you know, those who know, know at that point back in, back in those days, like it was, it was still super legit to be a, a kind of, uh, a world warrior. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's really well said. Wow. All right. We made it. It was, it was, <laughs> it was a bit lengthy. The, the, the thank you all for sticking with us. I hopefully you're doing all right over there, Phil. This has been fantastic. Let me just recap our list quickly before we get over to the listener list and we'll close out with our honorable mentions. Sound good? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Um, Keith McKenna at Keith McKenna on Twitter says, I'm going TJ Grant coming off the biggest win of his career in the middle of his prime years title shot there for him. Robbed of that and his career because of concussions. It's it's a guy who suffers with concussions. Obviously, that was a biased pick for me, which we covered. Thank you, Keith. Um, Let's go down. Andrew Millington, friend of the podcast, at Andrew Millington on Twitter. His number one is Ian McCall. And he says for him, he says, it's a wide gulf after that for me. And I don't really even like the guy. Starting with the Aussie Commission failing basic arithmetic, what follows was a legendary snake pick. Uh, snake bit streak and I love how he kind of categorizes his number two Bisping with juicers you know yep um, but Bisping uh, he is number three Tony Ferguson Paige noting Bisping with his number four which is Dominic Cruz uh, I, I, I I like both guys um, I, I, even if it's unpopular to like Dominic Cruz I, I, I do have a, a, a soft spot for him but he's not on here neither is Bisping like one, they either became or were able to become champions later after the snake bit in history, or were able to both secure prominent broadcasting jobs that most of the fighters would give their left nut for. So I don't <laughs> consider them that unlucky. And uh, number five, TJ Grant. Honorable mentions, Frank Mir's motorcycle accident and Kane's cardboard skeleton. Mm. Any comments on that list from Andrew? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, uh, Frank Mir's motorcycle accident, it's a very... It's a, it's like a real bad one, but also one that he was able to come back from really strongly, uh, at least yep. after you know after some time. Uh, so I mean, I think it, it ends up being sort of a lesson about Frank Mir's weird uh, ability to battle through adversity. Uh, Kane's cardboard skeleton, I have to say, is probably just the fault of himself and his trainers rather than bad luck. <laughs> yes. Yep. Uh, like the legendarily, the legendarily insane training regimen they had him on, which no heavyweight in the world could possibly survive, uh, eventually took its inevitable toll on him. They turned into it so hard they turned off the road. Yep. All right. The Jad and Kitties, I'd probably pronounce that poorly, at J A D A N. K E T I E S. John Jones for all the terrible things God keeps making him do. Ah, yes. 
curse you, God. I... Why won't you let this good man be and just stop making him do coke and cheat? How many times must one man find the path? I mean, hasn't he sacrificed enough? Yeah. Good call. <laughs> There's another good call coming over. Uh, 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 here, I'll just read that one actually next. Uh, from at Weatherwax, at which a broad. Conor McGregor, obviously. His foot was a balloon. The ref ended his fight with Mayweather early. People accuse him of awful crimes, and the list goes on. Uh, yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, Conor McGregor, I think, has, uh, Luca Bourdon on Twitter put it, like, he has his own timeline of excuses, uh, mm -hmm. which tend to be, you know, that after the fight, immediately after the fight, he's like, oh, that, that was the better man. Then shortly afterwards, he's, he's like, well, actually, you know, I had this injury, and then, a long time afterwards, he just like, well, I actually just won every round. It's just, uh, just really unfortunate that that they didn't score it for me or that I got finished. Yeah, or you know, is bad luck like, you know, how about all of his uh, after the fact matchmaking? How he almost fought RDA in Brazil. Uh, we, oh yeah, we were also robbed of a, of a Diego Sanchez fight. Oh man. Oh yeah, one of the like he has one of the the strongest imaginary strengths of schedule I've ever seen. Uh, it's just a tragedy that it doesn't exist. It's really a it's kind of criminal we left him off our list to be honest, but we'll we'll move on. Yeah, James Lawson at Jimmy Lawson on Twitter says I like Andrew's suggestions. Evan Dunham number one for me. RDA missing out uh, on McGregor and Woodley title fights. Angela Hill for having the worst luck with judges in the last five years. Lots of unpacking a little bit there, but anything jump out to you? Uh, yeah, I like all of those. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'd consider them as top five. I think Evan Dunham, you know, unfortunately, he had, I mean, he had that, um, you know, that sort of the Sean Shirt coming out party, which everyone, yeah. you know, knew was, a, knew was a robbery. But the thing is, in a weird way, I don't en end up thinking that actually hurt him because everyone it sort of brought a lot of goodwill behind him. Um, and a, lo a lot of what kind of stopped Dunham tended to be just uh, quick people who could hit him in the belly. That athletic um, ceiling, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I always That's have a huge... Body, yeah, like, body shots. Yeah, always have like a huge uh, soft spot for Evan Dunham. Like one of my, always one of my favorite guys to watch. Same. Obviously, I'm biased toward him being an extreme couture guy. Um, but yeah, you know, even the bad luck of having a fight uh, Tyson Griffin when he just got to Extreme Couture like that could have soured the relationship and he was able to both win the fight and still train at the gym so he was able to bounce back from these things fairly well mm -hmm. um, I, and I got soft spot for Angela Hill too although it's again yep. one of those things where she's ripe for that falling victim to the archetype that I'm so sympathetic toward where you're going to do a lot of fun little technical volume things and someone else is going to do something super athletic and just wash the perception away yeah, she's. I mean, she's building her. She's really building her case because uh, I don't think she lost either of those last two fights. Yeah, same um, here. She should be on her. Like so, like yeah, she's she's building her case for being for being super unlucky. I, I think you know most of her stuff before then I think is arguable, but now it is really annoying seeing someone coming into their sort of physical and technical prime, and then just seeing the judges rip them off. Yeah, and I'll use that to segue, uh, not to steal the first honorable mention that ends the listener list, but um, I put H's next to the honorable mentions that would make the truncated versions. All that pretty much means is like these are, I guess, ones that I would rank at the top of my honorable mention list. And maybe I'm a little biased, and uh, you know, uh, uh, because you know Bobby Green. Although you, you can't get mad at what recently happened at the timestamp this episode, he kind of did it to himself. Um, but he all obviously he fits that archetype for that that both that style of mm -hmm. there are fights where like even me I'm biased you know uh, I, I bet on I bet on Bobby Green on his last fight but I was also one of the few on Twitter defending the scorecard saying you can't give away you know certain mom big moments like that and expect that the judges are gonna side with your 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 your, your cool technical stuff that you did. Um, and then he fits the mention on this list as well because not just the bad luck from that perception, although not a lot of people see it that way, um, like me, or are, are favorable to those kind of technical defensive styles. But, like, you look at the guy's luck outside of having family members shot and murdered and yeah. all this shit between camp, like, camps and stuff, and 
he has the chip on his shoulder for sure, you know, that, you know, he's been not nice to, you know, myself included uh, in interviews with media, but I never hold that stuff personal. I always allow fighters that right because I have my own chips on my shoulder, so I understand. Um, but, like, so he, it's like he has it, but he, 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 he never uses it as an excuse, though. He never uses anything as an excuse uh, as far as, like, the shit that he could use for an excuse in his personal life. So I always have an appreciation whether he's letting me down <laughs> in his fights or not. Um, I still got love for Bobby Green. And uh, Dominic Cruz uh, was all the other age for people curious. Pretty much the two defensive guys who just have those styles that my contrarian ass are going to like and not they're not going to get credit for. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. So, uh, from my end on honorable mentions, uh, there was, I mean, there, there's a few of them. So there was, there was Eve Edwards, uh, obviously, you know, oh, the yeah. uncrowned, my favorite song uncrowned though. lightweight. Yep. Uncrowned lightweight champ. Sorry. Un- uncrowned lightweight champ. Yes, sir. Um, with one of the best head, still one of the best head kicks of all time against Josh Thompson. Yep. And also one of the only ever man men to ever get like cleanly knocked out by Sam Stout, uh, <laughs> yeah. which is like super weird. Uh, a slightly weird and contrarian one you might you might dig, uh, Tim Kennedy. Huh. Um, yeah, Yoel because, Romero fight, right? Not just the Yoel Romero fight, because you know, there's with the with the Stoolgate thing, but also because of where Tim where Kennedy was. He spent his entire career, uh, like he spent a lot of his like early formative career, or at least his his prime, stuck in strike force. And uh, like the, the construction of the strike force and UFC divisions meant that he would have been—I think he would have been super successful in the UFC. Like you know, he beat pretty much a prime Michael Bisping fairly clearly, um, and was just like you know he was an aggressive power wrestler. And oh, yeah. we saw what what like Chael Sonnen was able to do with that. Tim Kennedy did not really have the same weaknesses as Chael Sonnen. Like I was talking with Jack Slack on on Twitter recently, like. You know, there was the meme that Akami was uh, Sonnen, was like Sonnen with submission defense, but he wasn't. Kennedy was much closer to being Sonnen with submission defense than <laughs> Chael, than like Akami ever was. But he was stuck in Strike Force, where he was fighting horrific matchups like Jacare and Rockhold that he would just never ever beat. Um, Although I, I would argue, it was funny, I always remembered their. F- at least once, and it, it but it only shows up once. But I remember that, like uh, maybe even twice, but it never got uh, targeted officially. But he was supposed to fight Rockhold, I think, a couple times, like Challenger Series and whatnot. Before then, um, officially, he was supposed to fight him over a year before, or yeah, a year and a half before they fought. And I think he would have maybe had a better chance at that yeah. Rockhold if you look at Rockhold's trajectory, which is also kind of unfortunate. I'm not going to die on that hill or anything, but like. For what that's worth, but yeah, he came onto my radar when he beat Trevor Prangley. I really liked the work that he did, and even like that fight with Robbie Lawler. I know it was the blown up Robbie Lawler, but like he's doing stuff that like st- like from that fight until this day. Like when I'm in half guard, <laughs> I immediately want to hug tight and low on the hips, especially if it's like an MMA base and you can strike. Like, and because he, he had that half guard position so down for striking, where he could keep a control on the low hip um, and, and and leg. And then keep like a high arcing, hard to defend uh, shot off the lead side, and just kind of pound his guy out. And um, like, he did a lot of quiet stuff that was really, really hard to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a he's a sort of unfortunate guy, advan- example of a guy who has been like, I think he was a genuinely he was a genuinely very like good fighter for his his time who was just in he was just in the wrong place at the right time really i think uh i think he he could have done significant damage in the ufc division at that time but again he was stuck in strike force with a bunch of super powerful unkillable anti wrestlers yep um um so yeah on that note jacare Okay. Got to have him in there some way for an honorable mention. Again, another person who had his prime burned out waiting for a well-deserved title oh, shot and just yeah. ended, up, ended up having to kill poor Chris Camozzi over and over again. Um, oh, geez. That was so obvious at the time, wasn't it, that everybody was avoiding yeah. the guy? Mm-hmm. Um, Jared Brooks, he knocked himself out. <laughs> one of the... 
Uh, yep. One in ten times it happens. Like, that's not a very high percentage. Um, <laughs> and also, like, had... What was the weird thing that happened to him on his first fight in Rising? Like, it was a headbutt, no contest. And he also got robbed for beating the now flyweight champion, Davison Figueredo, despite being at a comical size disadvantage. Oh, um, Jesus. Yep. I mean, it still it still amuses me to think of this tiny obnoxious man as beating Davidson Figueredo, but uh, yeah, uh, undeniably unlucky. Uh, it's just also a guy that you can laugh at. Kenneth Williams, uh, he was the other guy I was thinking of from the Eugene Nagata thing, someone who oh, only yeah. fought Rampage and uh, Chuck Liddell. You reached deep, Jesus. Yes. Yeah, and the last two, which I thought of, it, well, Ray Borg, you got to have him in there somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, tons of, I mean, so some depressing. of it is own fault due to missing weight, but also just like illness, other people dropping out, glass in his face, uh, terrible outside life, you know, problems with his son. Uh, yeah. Nice. And then, uh, and then finally, because uh, we mentioned him, Todd Duffy. Yes. Uh, Definitely. The man who would be the, one of the next breed of the UFC heavyweights, except that he, he wasn't. And he was on the unfortunate end of the hammer fist of doom. Uh, he had that dire, like, that, that horrific fight where he fought um, Overeem in Dream on one oh, of the, the New Year's cards. Geez. You could just yeah. feel the anxiety coming through your screen. Of... Yeah, and he was just like, you could clearly he was just thinking, what am I doing here that was like horse meat like the the uber of ubers yeah. kind of folks yeah yeah he was he was looking like a um a rob liefeld drawing at that point um oh, man. by the way there's that simpsons i think like the duffman character from the simpsons i think it could be a perfect drop to have like i think he actually says duffman can't win <laughs> yeah <laughs> i always think of that when something unfortunate <laughs> happens to poor Todd duffy <laughs> yeah and then he gave us the Duffy punch against uh, the Sharkisha hook, I think, against oh, Frank Mir. Man. Again, somewhat his own fault, but yeah, oh, a, 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 a promising prospect who still occasionally, like, will do boxing that makes you think, man, this guy could be something, and then he'll do something completely insane that'll make you think, no, he won't. Right. Well, um, real quick, the Sharkisha punch and then that, that subsequent uh, break. Um, I talked to Todd. I actually almost I started up a podcast with him, fun fact, at a certain point in time, like four oh, years wow. ago. But he actually got concussion so Speaking of TJ Grant, I should say, he actually got really bad concussion symptoms post after that Frank Muir knockout specifically. So he, uh, you know, again, kind of adding to the case to, to your point, I guess, as far as bad luck. So there's that. Yeah. I mean, he always seemed like a very nice kind of uh, just – very uh hard to think what uh very sort of introverted um guy not the stereotype you would imagine by looking at him in other words yeah like a a very yeah just always had like a very weird like vibe about him when it came to to mma that this wasn't this wasn't quite what he was built for but that he would do it anyway because he was good at it yeah he Um, he does you you actually are kind of spot on having some conversations with him. Yeah, you, you'd you you'd be surprised talking to the guy for sure. Yeah, and also gave us uh, that turn in uh, Never Back Down to uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. as by far the most sympathetic character. In that I watched film. that like, earlier this year, I think, <laughs> yes. Oh, man, that's so good. Uh, I'll just reel through my list real quick before we get out of here. Gary Goodrich, obviously, speaking of oh, yeah. concussions, I mean, you, everyone talks about Overeem's list. Like, go, go, go back and go count Gary Goodrich's list of knockout losses. It's depressing. Um, David Terrell, who is like a guy who doesn't get much mention. I wasn't of the time. I started coming in toward the end of Terrell's career, uh, and he's still coaching guys, so he's not exactly like you know exactly that tragic. I forget like who's who's one fighter who's coaching right now. Um, he just lost. I think was it the, the, the diabetic middleweight Jordan Williams was that his name or something? But uh. uh I- David Terrell from the NorCal scene was just tearing things up, was like that phenom, and essentially had a bunch of, from personal issues to unfortunate luck, booking, and then ultimately sinus issues, I believe, that like just took, he had to have like multiple surgeries and burnt the prime of his career and just stuck to coaching. Um, Alan Belcher, who I have a soft spot for, didn't yep. make it, but the eye stuff. 
Alexander Gustafson, um, easy to see why he makes an honorable mention, but not on my list, but worth a mention. Yep. And lastly, I got to try to get a little clever. I thought this guy maybe would have been a hipster initially, but, um, you know, he's doing well at American Top Team, so he didn't, like, fall directly off a cliff, but he certainly got his most notable victory taken away from him, and that's Marcus Conan Silvera. You know, you know what I'm referencing here, Phil? No, not on top of my head. The UFC Ultimate Japan, he actually beat Sakuraba. And he wasn't supposed to beat him, by the way. And he went backstage and was debriefing or whatever, doing taking his things off, and there was a knock on his door. And a bunch of suited Japanese gentlemen, who may or may not have rhymed with Makuza, uh, politely encouraged him to come out and fight again. And this is actually on the record books. It's still listed. You'll see the same date and same night, him fighting Sakuraba. And this is the reason. <laughs> Um, ah. I don't know what else happened to that walk, but even Silvera, till recent interviews to this day, admits that it did happen. He doesn't go into detail, but he goes out there, and you guessed it, he lost to Sakuraba. Yeah, um, yeah. If you look on uh, Tapology, it's rare that you see uh, the decision for something being being listed as no contest armbar. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. He taps. You're not supposed to tap the, 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 their, their idol. <laughs> Listen, we started off the, 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 the list by saying, explaining the Japanese culture with your number five, Phil, on embracing the loser. That wasn't every time, okay? There was not There was another mm-hmm. dark side, a complete opposite side to that. And that's a prime example right there, folks. Yeah, it was uh, embracing the loser when <laughs> when the narrative required it. And the fact that I know this is an SEG era or whatever, or a pre-Zufa era, I should say, right? But the fact that it happened at a UFC show, like that mm-hmm. overt corruption, <laughs> it's just fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was fun. Went long, but I'm not surprised. I tend to go long. Uh, I, went, I think Connor held, held the number two number one for a while as far as long as episode and, and, and you're almost touching his. So um, thanks for coming in heavy and, and heavy hands like fashion, Phil. I appreciate you, man. Yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of what we do. We, uh, we ramble and we, we go over time. That's our, our skill. <laughs> <laughs> well, without time stamping things too much, I hope I didn't cause you personally to go over t- uh, too much time. You are a busy man, uh, especially right now. So I definitely appreciate your time um, tonight, sir. Yeah, no, it's been absolutely fantastic. I really loved it. Like it was, it was great. Kind of touching on all these, uh, like, old school unfortunates. I guess is, is the best way of describing them. And that's the thing, you know, it, it gets it gets really mundane. As you know, we both write previews or do podcasts of some sorts on some sort of regular basis, right? And it can be really mundane doing these things over and out. So selfishly, um, it's nice. Hopefully, you felt the same. And for the listeners, hopefully, you guys either learn more or encouraged to go back and watch some older fights to learn more. Yeah, it was great. It was like, yeah, it's always great to like escape the, the daily grind and then, you know, pull all these guys that you'd completely forgotten out of your memory. And you're like, Oh yeah, Brad Blackburn or, you know, Jason high or, you know, men, tons of these other guys where you're just like, Oh yeah, I remember this guy. He was really good. And these little things popping up and you remember what it felt like to watch them. And yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to, to escape like the relentlessness of, of, of the modern schedule. Makes you hate MMA a lot less, doesn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> In the current slew and state. On that note, um, we're still here, and, 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 and I'm grateful to be here, obviously. Phil, obviously they can find your work at bloodyelbow.com. The Heavy Hands Podcast, one of the best podcasts, one of the only MMA podcasts that I can still listen to these days. Um, I'll let you give the official plugs and add on to that. The stage is yours, sir. Uh, yeah, I mean that that's pretty much it at the moment. So you can catch me uh, at uh, uh, on on the Heavy Hands podcast with uh, my co-host Connor Rebush. I'm on Twitter uh, at uh, Evil Greg Jackson, uh, I'm the man who was once upon a time responsible for everything bad that happened in MMA. Um, and yeah, writing on bloodyelbow.com. I also do some uh, I also do some uh, like video game breakdowns and stuff over on for the uh video game tekken over at uh 
for uh, that blasted salami YouTube channel. So check that out as well if you're interested in that in that video game. But yeah, um, just want to say like thanks for having me on, Dan. It's been it's been really great. You're lucky we're out of time, man. I didn't even get to talk your head about about the Tekken days, man. We could have had some conversation. <laughs> I got to get your co-host back on, Connor, for another top five. He's overdue. But next time I have you on, if if uh, if, if that assuming you would want to come on, maybe we'll do like a top five uh, Tekken analogs for MMA. Hell yeah. Sounds like a good plan. Sounds like a fun one. All right. Thanks, Phil. Thank you all for listening. And until next time, protect your neck. <laughs>